Good morning, everyone. We have uh, people joining us at the moment, so we'll take a minute or two to let them come into the room before we get started. We'll have people joining us, so just one more minute and uh, then, we'll, then we'll get going. Lovely. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the NHS Charging Conference. I'm Ros Bragg, Director of Maternity Action. I'll be chairing today's event. As well as working at Maternity Action, I am Chair of the Board of Trustees at LAG. This conference is the first joint project for the two organisations. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping matters. We will be recording the conference and making it available online. We'll also be sharing bios, slides and notes provided by the speakers. We'll be hearing firstly from our keynote speaker, then from two panel sessions with four speakers each. We will hold questions until the end of each session. I feel like I should say that very clearly. We'll hold the questions until the end of each session. Uh, to ask a question, please put your question in the Q&A and not the chat. You're most welcome to use the chat, but we'll look to the Q&A for the questions. We'll be taking a short break after the first panel session. We're aiming to finish up just before 1 p.m. Uh, just for clarity about the purpose of the day, we'll be exploring issues in charging. This is not introductory training. If you do need information about the introduction to how charging works, please contact Maternity Action. We do have training available. Charging for NHS care is a policy of the hostile environment, one of a suite of policies aiming to make life in the UK unbearable for people without secure immigration status. The government's rationale for the policy is that it ensures everyone makes a fair contribution to the NHS. In practice, it's a policy which is profoundly unfair and one which has a brutal impact on migrants, many of whom are in very vulnerable situations. We decided to hold this conference now as the situation is worsening for anyone receiving a bill from the NHS. Changes to the immigration rules last year have made settlement significantly harder for anyone with an outstanding debt. We wanted this conference to showcase the new and creative legal work to challenge NHS charges. We hope that this will inspire further work. We have timed this conference in the lead in to International Women's Day. Charging impacts on all migrants in need of healthcare, but it disproportionately impacts on women. Charging for maternity care is one aspect of this, and we'll be hearing more from our speakers on this. I'd now like to introduce our keynote speaker, Xuxin Liu from Doughty Street Chambers. Xuxin's expertise covers a broad range of subject matters, including community care, mental health and mental capacity, healthcare, education, housing, welfare benefits, benefits, human trafficking, immigration, asylum, and deprivation of liberty, both in the context of immigration detention and court of protection. She pursues significant public interest litigation on behalf of individuals and organisations. Xuxin is committed to civil legal aid and supporting individuals to have effective access to legal remedies. She's on the panel of Gina Council for the Equality and Human Rights Commission. She undertakes advisory and consultancy work for non-government and intergovernmental organisations and state bodies in the UK and other jurisdictions. She acted as the specialist legal advisor to the Joint Committee on Human Rights and its Immigration Detention Inquiry in 2018-2019. She also regularly provides training to government departments, local authorities and public interest groups in the UK and internationally. I'd like to welcome Shushin Liu. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ross, for that introduction um, and, and welcome everyone to today's conference. Um, as Ross said, um, next Wednesday, 8th of March is International Women's Day. Um, and for the purposes of this conference, um, I kind of had a look at the theme and this year's theme is Embrace Equity. Um, the website um, for International Women's Day say this about the theme. Equity is not just a nice to have, it's a must have. A focus on gender equity needs to be part of every society's DNA. Um, what's interesting about the theme is it, it draws a distinction between equity and equality, 
And it got me um, thinking about the distinction between the two concepts. Um, equality, I think, means each individual or group of people is are given the same resources or opportunities. So it's about equal equality of opportunities. It's less about outcomes. Equity, on the other hand, recognizes that each person has different circumstances and allocates the exact resources and opportunities needed to reach an equal outcome. So in essence, it's not enough to have equality of opportunities. It's also necessary and perhaps more important to have equitable outcomes. Well, how does that apply in the context of our topic for today concerning NHS charging? Um, I mean, as Ross already said, the NHS charging regime is a measure that sits within the hostile environment policy, which purpose is to deter illegal immigration, um, by making life so harsh and difficult for people who don't have immigration status to survive that they will leave voluntarily and to deter others from coming to the UK illegally. I appreciate the government has tried to rebrand this as the compliant environment measures, but I'm someone who believes strongly in calling things as they are without a gloss. So it's hostile environment for me um, as a description. Um, as a hostile environment measure, NHS charging operates by requiring people who are considered overseas visitors, almost always migrants, to pay up front to access NHS treatment. If you can't pay, you can't get the treatment. Of course, if the treatment is urgent or necessary, for example, maternity care, treatment will be provided, but it will still be charged at a hefty charge of 150% of what it would cost the NHS. If the charges for NHS treatment of over 500 are not repaid within two months of the charge being invoiced by the trust, the NHS debt is reported to the Home Office and its existence relied upon to refuse an application for further leave. There are limited exemptions and we'll probably hear about some of those today, for, such as for asylum seekers, children in care, victims of trafficking, in certain circumstances, victims of torture, domestic abuse and sexual violence. For anyone else who has irregular immigration status, treatment comes with a price tag. Um, as Ross has already highlighted in her introductory remarks, the government's justification for the policy is that it is only fair and that free NHS healthcare is available to people who have rights to be in the UK. When someone regularizes their status, they become eligible for NHS care. Sounds attractive enough, but is it? The government recently published a much anticipated evaluation of hostile environment measures. The actual title develop is Developing an Evaluation Strategy for the Compliant Environment. Although equality impact assessments have been carried out in the past when amendments have been made to the NHS charging regulations, this appears at least to me to be the first evaluation to look properly at internal government data on NHS charging. What it found was that 63% of people affected by NHS charging are women. Not all are irregular migrants. Older people are li more likely to have outstanding debt. The evaluation doesn't go on to analyze the profile of women who have been charged for NHS treatment, their age group, the background to how they become chargeable, the kind of treatment for which they are chargeable, and their socioeconomic circumstances at the time of charge and thereafter. What the government's evaluation does identify is what um, Ross has already um, foreshadowed, that NHS charging undoubtedly has a disproportionately greater impact on women than on men. That essential conclusion actually echoes research that was undertaken in 2018 and 2019, published in the Journal of Public Health in 2020, um, which was based on freedom of information requests sent to NHS trusts. That research also found 63% of NHS charges are of women, but more so, that research found that almost half are of reproductive age. 47.9% of women being charged were 16 to 40 year olds. Also, it found that when people are charged, when women are charged, they are charged higher amounts for treatment and more frequently for urgent treatment. Although the 2020 research was unable to obtain a breakdown of the type of treatment charged, given the profile of women affected by NHS charging, and the proportion of charges being related to urgent treatment. It's reasonable to infer that women are disproportionately affected by NHS charging, largely due to their need for maternity care. A piece of research done in 2021 by the National, National Child Mortality Database 
lend significant support to this inference. It found in one audit of an NHS trust that in one year, nearly one out of 12 pregnant women booking with the trust were sent letters of a potential NHS trust charge. Of course, statistics don't tell the full story. They tell us a bit about the what, but they don't answer the why. And in this context, context is everything. The hostile environment policy has led to significant changes in immigration rules and policy, which have made it much more difficult for migrants to secure and maintain regulation regular immigration status. I know that this will be looked at in much more detail later this morning, but in brief, the changes to the rules have introduced um, the requirement of longer um, number of years of lawful residence before um, you can achieve settlement. At the same time, the duration of each visa grant has shortened, resulting in migrants having to make multiple applications for leave to remain before they can reach the um, stage of settlement. Applicants also have to pay um, hefty fees and demonstrate that they meet the criteria for each renewal of leave. Applications for leave to remain can be treated as invalid if the proper form is not used or if the fee is not paid or waived. And the level at which the fees are set has increased exponentially over the years. As these costs are high and criteria are strict, multiple applications put people at increased risks of becoming undocumented. The current estimate suggests that there are about there are over 600,000 undocumented migrants within the UK, of which about a third are estimated to be women. A relationship breakdown or lack of funds can prevent women from maintaining or securing uh, immigration status, rendering them undocumented. And immigration applications can obviously also be refused because of an outstanding debt to, to the NHS for maternity care. The problem is once women become undocumented, it in is increasingly difficult to regularize their leave um, because of the high fees required to, in order to submit an application. Furthermore, cuts to legal aid have left women with the option, fewer women with the option of legal advice that's free. Although the voluntary sector has stepped in to try and fill the gaps in accessibility to immigration law advice, this relies on women being linked to the voluntary sector. Those who aren't are often too um, unable to advise, uh, access any legal advice and assistance. Research has shown links between immigration policies and worsening health outcomes from undocumented migrants, particularly um, as undocumented migrants are all too frequently experiencing high levels of poverty, um, often only able to access informal um, healthcare services with no access to health insurance and barriers to access primary care. International bodies, including the UCL Lancet Commission on Migration and Health, have voiced concerns over migrants being excluded from universal health care without proper international standards, targets, and public health initiatives in place to address the issue. Public Health England, now called the Office of Health Improvement and Disparities, identified NHS charging for maternity care as a key issue that exacerbates poorer health outcomes for women and babies from minority ethnic communities. Confidential inquiries into maternity deaths um, between the periods of 2015 and 2017 have found at least three um, of 209 matern maternal deaths likely attributable to women avoiding NHS care due to the fear of being charged. Maternity Actions Research Report in 2019, a vicious circle, the relationship between NHS charges for maternity care found that charging deterred women from attending for maternity care. Uh, women often avoid um, or miss appointments um, only to avoid being charged sums that they can never afford to pay back to avoid the immigration consequences of accruing debt that they cannot um, repay. Women who are charged are faced with impossible choices. They can have some amount of care, potentially pushing them and their families into poverty. They can have a termination, which is also chargeable, or they can try to navigate the system to secure an applicable uh, exemption. All of this can increase stress and anxiety to women during pregnancy and can lead to poor maternity health outcomes. That impossible choice that migrant women face is also a push-pull factor that leads too many of them to become indebted in dangerous or difficult social or exploitative relationships or to return to these at the risk of their own safety 
in order to pay treatment charges. Maternity Action's research in 2018 and 2019 showed that exemptions from charging for domestic abuse and sexual violence are not sufficient safeguards to militate, militate against these range of impossible choices facing undocumented migrant women. They are narrowly drawn so that, for example, domestic abuse victims would have to prove that the treatment sought is directly caused by the abuse and be expected to have their accounts of domestic abuse scrutinized before they can benefit from exemptions from charging. Victims of female genital mutilation who suffer lifelong health consequences as a result of the violent act will not be exempt from NHS charging other than treatment directly caused by the FGM. You'll hear more about this, no doubt, in the course of today's conference. Where women are able to regularize their leave and cease to be chargeable, the effects of NHS charging don't disappear. For many women, the NHS debt has already been accrued. According to both Doctors of the World and Maternity Action, charges for maternity care commonly hover around 7,000 for ordinary care, with higher charges for women who have C-sections or otherwise require additional care for themselves or for their babies. The fees are often too large um, that the prospects of repayment are slim, at least in the short to medium term. This means that women will be exposed to the risk of debt being relied on by the Home Office to refuse further leave each time they come to make an application to extend their leave. The risk of becoming undocumented simply doesn't go away in these circumstances. Where efforts to repay the debt are made, as maternity action found, this is inf not infrequently done at the cost of spending money on food and other essential living needs. The current cost of living crisis is only going to exacerbate the poverty experienced by migrant women in this position. Even where the Home Office exercises its discretion not to refuse to grant their leave, women find themselves being stopped at port and detained and questioned about their NHS debt and put under pressure to repay their debt, even, even pursuant to an unpublished and we would say unlawful policy of the Home Office to do that, something that you will hear more about later on today. Um, these lasting hostile um, effects of NHS charging ignore the fact that many women who are affected are eligible for leave to remain, importantly on grounds of family life, and are most likely going to be on an immigration route that leads to settlement. They are in that, that strict sense, not health visitors. Rather, they are people who are here to stay, here to contribute to society, except many can't because the charges and the burden of repayment push them into poverty for extended periods of time, notwithstanding their regularized status. And in this survey of intersectional discrimination caused by NHS charging against migrant women, we haven't even considered the position of women, uh, children, many of whom are born in the UK and are losing their NHS entitlement due to immigration and financial statuses of their parents. A whole session is dedicated to the child's perspective today. The government has yet to undertake a proper economic analysis of the NHS charging regime, particularly the cost of delayed access to healthcare caused by fears of NHS charging. We already know from the Department of Health and Social Care itself that the actual cost recovery for chargeable NHS treatment is seriously compromised by the reality that undocumented migrants make up the largest group of chargeable people, and a vast majority of them have few resources to pay charges. What is less properly appreciated is the fact that a substantial proportion of them are not health visitors, um, but people who are eligible for settlement on long residence grounds. Yet the research today, even from the government, show the financial burden at risk of NHS charging are disproportionately experienced by these women. The government has long denied that NHS charging regime is discriminatory. It has pointed to the fact that the regime applies to everyone without immigration status, men and women equally. But that rather misses the point, doesn't it? That it's clear given the now stark evidence available to it, uh, there is a disproportionate and distinct effect of NHS charging on women. But even recognizing this disproportionate effect, I would suggest is not enough. The cynic in me would say it would be very easy to pay lip service and acknowledge that evidence. But what is now required is a brave rethink of the charging regime and whether it is actually achieving what is set out to do, given the rate of cost recovery is poor and given the 
additional hidden costs created by the deterrent and chilling effect of the regime. A rethink obviously requires political will, but absent that, it will need to rely on lawyers and policy advocates like all of you in the audience today put to, to put on your collective thinking caps and be creative in pushing back at the boundaries that have been constructed around this hostile regime so that the policy on access to free healthcare actually produces equitable outcomes. And today's conference is a unique opportunity for creative and expert minds to gather together to have this collective conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shushin. Fantastic overview of this very messy, difficult area. Uh, we'll now move to our first panel session, which is NHS charging from a child's rights perspective. Uh, just to flag up that we will be, we are recording uh, today's session, so this will be available um, immediately after the conference is finished. We have four speakers in this session who will be addressing different aspects of the child's rights perspective. Sasha Rosansky from Dayton Pierce Glynn, Shushin Liu again will be joining us, Shushin's from Dowdy Street Chambers, Simon Cox from Dowdy Street Chambers, and Iona Pinter from the Department of Social Policy at the LSE. Um, as I said earlier, please put any questions you have in the Q&A and uh, we'll put them to the speakers at the end of this panel session. Can I now introduce Sasha Rosansky? Actually, Ros, I'm going to go first. Ah, oh, Alona. Okay, no please. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much. Um, is it all right if I share my screen? Uh, yeah. Um, thanks very much uh, for inviting me to speak as part of this panel. Um, it, the NHS charging issue is, is hugely important, as Shushan has outlined. Um, and um, from my work previously at the Children's Society, um, but also within um, more recent contexts um, at the LSE, um, it's something that I've touched upon, although my focus is um, on poverty and inequality more broadly within the immigration and asylum system. So um, I'm going to go first within this group and try and set out the context for um, children who are um, affected by NHS uh, charging um, and talk about uh, firstly undocumented children um, and, and some of the policies in relation to the hostile environment and then focus a bit more on poverty and debt um, towards, towards the end of the presentation. Um, so uh, firstly to begin with which children are affected by NHS charging as um, obviously lots of experts within, within the audience already will, will know that um, children are not exempt from NHS charging. Um, and generally it is children who and young people who have an irregular or unresolved immigration status that may be most affected, um, but also others who are affected because of the kind of lack of awareness around rights and entitlements. And through my own research with asylum seeking families who are receiving asylum support, um, some of those experiences also relate when families, uh, even though they're entitled, um, not to be not to be charged or exempted from the charging um, may still uh, be affected by some of that some of that kind of gatekeeping. Um, while migrants who have leave to remain or a visa will generally have paid the immigration health surcharge, so will be exempt from the charging. Um, and there will be also other categories who are exempt from charging, like asylum seekers, refugees, uh, those who are receiving asylum support and looked after children. And we'll talk more about that throughout the session. Um, so how do children become undocumented? Um, so uh, often the, the various pathways into irregularity or undocumentedness for children, um, some that are similar uh, as with adults, but, but also um, there are some unique ways in which children may become undocumented. So um, they may enter on a visa and overstay, uh, limited uh, leave to remain, or they may enter irregularly uh, or through, through, um, through clandestine entry. Um, 
they may also not leave the country after, uh, for instance, an asylum claim when they've been uh, when they've exhausted appeal rights. Although for the most part, for, if families are receiving Section 95 support after they've exhausted appeal rights, they in theory shouldn't uh, be subject to the NHS charges. Um, but uniquely, children can also become undocumented by being born to, um, to parents who have an irregular immigration status. Um, so we, as Shushan said before, um, there are some estimates about how big the population of unaccompanied, undocumented children in the UK are, um, but we don't actually have any concrete data about this. Um, so the estimates, uh, the most recent estimates that have been published by a couple of different research um, institutions estimate that there are about 800,000 undocumented migrants in the UK at the end of 2017, uh, including 215,000 children, of which 135,000 were estimated to be UK born. Um, but there are significant problems with these figures. As I said, they're not, uh, they're not actual numbers. They're based on um, different survey and administrative data. Um, the Home Office only publishes um, data on irregular entries via small boat, small boat crossing currently, um, although they are considering other approaches, but because of the kind of challenges with methodologies and, and, and also I'd say political um, unwillingness, I think, sometimes to invest in, in research in this space, um, we don't have very good information. But I think that information is important because it allows us to um, evaluate and plan policy initiatives effectively. Um, so we, we know that um, there are various challenges for children, young people and families who are undocumented. Migrants have faced long-standing exclusions from social uh, public services and uh, limited rights as a result, particularly of having um, an irregular immigration status. There was quite a comprehensive study on the experiences of undocumented migrant children and families um, that was published in 2012, which was prior to the, um, the introduction of the hostile environment measures. Um, and they did consider health issues within that context and found that the combination of precarious immigration status, restricted rights of access to healthcare and financial hardship um, can have negative effects on migrants' physical and mental health. Um, so I think one of the really important things to think about within the context of NHS charging is that um, children and families are not only affected by the, by the charging regime, but also by the range of ways in which they're restricted from accessing both public and private um, services. So uh, under the hostile environment, there was a kind of strategic and um, comprehensive uh, agenda to tackle irregular immigration by limiting access to various public and, and private services. Um, and the key kind of components of that being uh, employment restrictions, the right to work, the right to rent, which was introduced um, under Theresa May, uh, access to public funds, restricting access to public funds, which was um, has been around for, for many years under successive governments, but under particularly with the introduction of um, the 10 year route to settlement and the extension of um, the, the, the routes to settlement in, in, in other ways, um, the kind of the impact of not being able to access public funds has 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 been um, has worsened um, in that sense. Um, so other components, as we're, we're talking about today, obviously the, the NHS charging regime, um, bank accounts and uh, driving licences. Um, the, the Home Office just last month published um, a series of documents as part of their review of the compliant environment, which I'd really urge you to read. Um, uh, it does provide some interesting information, including on the disproportionate impact on different components of the hostile environment on um, women, for instance, um, in, in certain categories, particularly in relation to public funds. Um, so although the compliant environment, as, as the Home Office describes, is designed to impact adults, um, there is quite a lot of evidence, uh, growing evidence, that some measures in particular may disproportionately affect children. Um, and the area that I've focused on mostly has been in relation to NRPF restrictions. 
and um, I'll talk more about this in a bit. Um, so how are children affected by NHS charging specifically? So as I said, children are not exempt from, from the charging regime um, and therefore are affected both directly as patients, um, but also indirectly as dependents um, it, where their parents or carers are unable to get access healthcare or are affected by NHS charges. Um, and um, surprisingly in the equality, well, perhaps not surprisingly, but in the uh, equality impact assessment that was published last month, the Home Office uh, states in relation to age that there aren't any direct effects on children because it's their parents that pay uh, the NHS charges, not them. And um, there may be some indirect effects on some of the components like uh, access to public funds, but generally children aren't directly affected because they don't, they're not the benefit recipient <laughs> and they're, they're generally not um, the ones that would be working. So therefore the, the, they're not impacted. But in reality, and, and what um, overwhelmingly the evidence um, shows is that uh, children are impacted in a number of different ways. Um, so a survey of um, health professionals through the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health found that um, children and families were deterred from seeking health services. Um, they delayed in accessing treatment, which then led to worsening health outcomes. Um, and in one particularly stark case, um, uh, a professional uh, talked about a case where a child had been left, um, a child with a life limiting um, health condition had been left unaccompanied because they knew that that way they would, uh, they would be able to access health care. Um, in addition to the health outcomes, there are obviously the, um, the fact that families would incur charges and debts as a result of, of of the regime, and that affects household income as well as mental health and well-being. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in relation to some research that we did in relation to debt later on. Um, it affects, as well as, as Shruton said, um, families' ability to regularise their status and secure settlement. But more broadly, also important to remember that um, undocumented children face significant health risks that differ from the local population, and some of that might be to do with um, the racism that they experience, uh, uh, like other um, um, ethnic minority and racial uh, communities, but also as a result of forced migration um, journeys and, and pre-migration uh, experiences of trauma and abuse. And so uh, they are already potentially predisposed to having um, additional health needs. So I'm going to talk um, for the rest of the, the presentation about poverty and debt. Um, so we know that child poverty is a critical measure of child development and health. Um, and research um, has highlighted children's own experiences of poverty and certainly that they are not passive um, within family decision making around household resources, but they're in fact active participants uh, within those decisions, uh, utilizing, economizing behaviors to help families um, gain income as well as um, save and, and um, participate in different ways. Um, but I wanted to point to one particular study, which I think is really useful in this context. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a study which looks at the impact of income specifically, as opposed to other factors. And often poverty is, is um, conflates various aspects like parental education um, and housing. Um, but, but here, this study looks specifically at uh, the evidence base for whether money makes a difference in, in children's outcomes. And it finds, um, uh, I think it considers about 61 studies, including 17 of which specifically look at health outcomes. So they look at a range of different children's outcomes from education, cognitive development, social and emotional um, and behavioral development, and then health outcomes as well, um, and find generally very strong evidence that income not only is associated with poor outcomes in children, but actually has causal effects on a range of their outcomes. Um, and so the flip side of that increasing income has positive effects on, on children's outcomes. Um, we don't know a huge amount um, about um, poverty among migrant children within the UK, 
uh, partly because the, the kind of surveys and administrative data that's published that measures poverty doesn't include children or rather children's immigration status, although they may be included within the surveys. Um, but what we do know from um, various research, including um, some some analysis that colleagues at CASE have done is that children in migrant families and those with foreign born parents are at much greater risk of poverty um, than their peers. So one um, analysis in 2016 found that 45, almost half of children with foreign born parents uh, were in poverty compared to about a quarter of children with UK born parents. Um, and then a separate study looked at um, the risks of poverty among children in recent migrant families, so those that had been in the UK for under 10 years compared to those longer resident families. And they found that on all four measures of poverty, um, children in non-EEA recent migrant families were at much higher risk of poverty. So almost half were in relative low income were on relative low income after housing costs compared to about 27% of um, long-term resident families. And then the poverty was also found to be deeper for, for those families. So um, twice as many children in non-EEA recent migrant families were um, on severe low income and material deprivation as, as their peers. There's also growing research looking at poverty and destitution among migrant um, children. And some of this we um, were involved in um, I was involved in when I was at the Children's Society, so we had a programme of work around destitution and poverty um, alongside wider programmes around poverty and debt. We also looked quite a bit at children who were separated from their families and, and particularly the experience of destitution among care leavers um, and, uh, and their access to mental health care, as well as um, the difficulties that they faced in regularising their status. Um, so I just want to pick out one um, final, um, make one final um, point or <laughs> several points around a piece of research that we did on family debt, um, because I think often poverty and debt are conflated, um, but I think uh, we were focusing specifically on debt through, through a programme of work, and, and for this piece of research we look specifically at children, how children are affected by debt um in terms of their mental health and, and well-being and um, using analysis from the millennium cohort study we were able to show that debt and poverty are associated with separate effects on children's mental health so we found that children on low income um, are at greater risk of poor mental health but we also found that separately the number of debt types that families have rather than the overall amount of debt were associated with poor mental health um, in children um, and then uh, children in households with debt were five times more likely to have low well-being than those without. Um, so I don't know. Sorry, could I interrupt? Just uh, if you wouldn't mind wrapping up. Wrapping up, yeah. Um, debt is obviously a huge problem for families with NRPF and um, some citizens advice research um, has highlighted um, that. So just to conclude then, I think the key points really for me are that children and young people are directly and indirectly affected by NHS charging, leading to avoidance delays um, and accessing healthcare, um, as well as the impact on household income and status. Um, undocumented children, um, this doesn't happen in a vacuum, Un undocumented children already face poverty, destitution, insecure housing and marginalisation through the various um, compliant environment policies. Um, poverty, really importantly, has a causal effect on a range of children's outcomes, and family debts are also associated separately with children's low well-being and poor mental health. Um, so these are important things to think about within this context. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alona. That's, that's a fantastic overview of this area. Um, our next speaker is Sasha Rosansky. Sasha is from Dayton Pierce Glynn. Sasha. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to focus on a specific group of um, children who are uh, children who come to the UK separated from any family members um, known legally as unaccompanied asylum seeking children. Um, to the end of March 2022, there were 5,570 um, looked after children who'd had the status of being unaccompanied asylum seeking children. Um, 
that's quite a 34% increase from the previous year end of March, um, but that was because there had been a dip during the pandemic, um, although there is an increase from pre-pandemic levels, um, but the numbers sort of going back for the last 15, 20 years are sort of between two to 3,000, three to four, and so this is high now, as I said, 5,570, but because there had been a dip during the pandemic, possibly. Um, the total number of all um, looked after children is um, to the end of March 2022 is 82,170. So it's a 7% um, rate for the number of looked after children who are have got the status of un being unaccompanied asylum seeking children. Um, looked after children are exempt from healthcare charges, but that exemption ends once they're no longer looked after, so once they become 18 years old. So I'm going to focus on, on that position. Um, so if if a child has been looked after for at least 13 weeks before they're 18, then they will become on, go on to become a care leaver. And there's a huge range of duties owed to care leavers because of the very, very poor outcomes for children who've been in the care system. Um, and that includes much poorer health outcomes. And so if, if a person doesn't have leave to remain, those health uh, poor health will require healthcare, um, and will be, there'll be charges for those generally. Um, but also, you know, the outcomes much poor in you know, care. Children who've been in care more likely to go to prison, uh, less likely to be in education, less likely to have um, uh, be employed. And just the statistics are that from ages 19 to 21 year olds, 11% um, of all children who were in care. They're not in education, employment, or training compared with 38%. Sorry, got this the wrong way around. 38% of children who have in care are not in education, employment, or children compared with 11% of all young people who've not been in care at the same age group. So it's a very stark difference. So um, there's a huge, a huge range of duties from local from for local authorities to meet towards these people who are now treated as care leavers. Um, and just numbers on care leavers. Um, so in 2022, um, care leavers who were unaccompanied minors, there were 2,190 care leavers aged 18 and 8,160 care leavers aged 19 to 21. The government statistics are that um, for the 18 year olds, 24%, and the 19 to 19 to 21 year olds, 26 percent of all care leavers are former unaccompanied asylum seeking children, which seems high compared to the figures I gave uh, just a few minutes ago of being 7 percent of all care leavers. And the government statistics note that's because it's been a very high increase in the number of asylum unaccompanied asylum seeking children since 2015. But that doesn't bear out with the figures I've gone back through. Uh, it's, you know, it's maybe an increase of one or two thousand, but compared to the um, 82,000 total children in care. I'm not sure where those statistics are. I haven't looked into the accuracy of where they've got from it. Just it does seem a bit odd, but nonetheless, there is a seems to be a high percentage of um well, I'm calling this a high percentage of unaccompanied asylum seeking children who are who are care leavers, no duties. And so given that according to government statistics, nearly a quarter of their the care leavers are from this group. They should be having better procedures for looking after them, which are, which is unfortunately often not done, which I'll come to shortly. So just to summarise briefly, they're very large raft of duties. Um, I think the starting point should be um, section one of the Children and Social Work Act 2017, which is the corporate, pairing, corporate parent duty. Um, there are seven principles that underpin this, which is contained within statutory guidance for local authorities on the on applying corporate parenting principles looked after children and care leavers. I'm not going to go through the seven principles, but the, the first one I will say is uh, it's to act in the best interests and promote the physical and mental health and well-being of those children and young people who have been looked after or are care leavers. Um, the statutory guidance states that um, local authorities need to have a sense of visionary and responsibility towards looked after children and care leavers as, as, as a priority. And as I said, it's statutory guidance that has to be followed. Um, and so as a corporate parent, what's, what the local authorities 
need to be doing is thinking that every decision they're making for the for the care lever and the child would this be good enough for my child and it, so the corporate it, it's every single decision that they're taking it needs to be on that basis um the then the, the next oh, so that's that so that that the corporate parent principle needs to be then viewed besides specific statutory duties which are largely contained within the within part three of the children at 1989 and again it's a very large range of duties towards care leavers um generally encapsulated within pathway plans and personal advisors so um a pathway plan is a document that should be reviewed at least every six months um, by the care leavers personal advisor who's uh, so local authorities must must provide a personal advisor to the care leaver who will sh it should be the same person that goes with them throughout their journey as they're leaving care into adulthood um, and we'll review the pathway plan with them at least every six months and the pathway plan sets out um, key areas in the young person's life, their goals and how to achieve them, who will achieve them, who will be responsible for achieving them, um, and contingency plans if things go wrong. And so the key areas in the young person's life will be their health, it will be um, education, employment, relationships. Um, and so, for example, if if it's if it's about education, it might say that the young person, their their goal, educational goals are to go to university, but they may not have the qualifications to go there. So it'll set out what needs to be achieved. So to, you know, to go to college and do an access course, for example, and it will say who who's responsible for making sure that happens. And depending on you know the wherewithal, the ability of the young person, it might just be them. But many children who have been in care don't necessarily have that ability. They haven't had the structure. Um, of of having you know living in a settled family home, you know, maybe in different placements, not have adults there to guide them, and for um, children or young people who are here without their families, you know, may not speak English fluently and may not know how to navigate the system. Mm -hmm. So it's it's it should well, it would likely to be that the personal advisor or other people will also be named in the pathway plan as being responsible for helping mm -hmm. that young person achieve that goal. Um, and, and yes, so every six months it should be reviewed so we can look back and see, well, has that happened? And if not, why? Well, you know, maybe we need to do something different in the next six months to make sure this goal has taken place. Um, the reason why this is relevant today is because for um, former unaccompanied asylum seeking children, um, their immigration has already been and alone is is key it's you know it's, it's it's it goes through everything if if a young person's immigration status is, is not sorted out then this will be barriers to their employment and to their education and to accessing free health care um unfortunately um while it, you know i've seen many 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 pathway plans and while immigration is often mentioned it's 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 <laughs> Most commonly, it's mentioned in a way to say, oh, you haven't got your immigration status, you haven't got leave to remain, therefore you can't go to college. And it doesn't say much more than that. It, um, and in my view, because it is so central to all the other areas of a young person's life, it should be at the forefront. And I'm not saying this never happens. Of course, there will be some personal advisors and social workers who it is forefront and central to. But in my experience, it's, I suppose people come to see a solicitor because things have gone wrong. So I'm going to see the ones that have gone wrong rather than the ones that have gone well. Um, the examples that I'll see is, oh, you know, you haven't got immigration status. Once you've got once you've got it sorted out, you, the young person who we've got loads of responsibilities for, once you've got it sorted out, um, come back and we'll try and, you know, you can get and go to college at that point. Whereas in my view, um, that's not what should be happening. Um, you know, under, so I'm not an immigration expert, but as I understand, um, unaccompanied minors will generally and doesn't always happen be given leave to remain until they're 17 and a half and providing they apply for an extension before that leave expires that leave will continue until the home office makes a further decision um but what i've seen happening is that a young person may not doesn't doesn't know that the child in their care gets that leave till they're 17 and a half you know it's Doing everything they can. Oh, I seem to have frozen. 
oh hello um doing everything they can you know is, is it good enough for my child just to not make sure the home office gets their leave from me when it's so important to all the you know nearly everything in their life that's not good enough by the local authority um you know it's 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 always been difficult to get legal aid immigration solicitors but right now it's even harder it's really really difficult and again that's by design it's the whole part of the hostile environment it's really hard to get legal aid immigration solicitors and so what i've seen with clients is that um it's you know they haven't been able to find a legal aid immigration solicitors they haven't been able to make an in-time appeal an in-time application for further leave be able to get a, you know, further representations together and the personal advisors and social workers will say well come back when you've got somebody you know you know you, you haven't been able to do this and the responsibility should be with the local authority to help and in my view if if it's not been possible for an immigration solicitor to be obtained under legal aid then the local authority should give serious consideration to paying privately for an immigration solicitor because the difficulty is not so much difficulty finding a good immigration solicitor if you're paying privately. You know, that that should be something that is, you know, if if, if local authority should be thinking, if this was my child, would I be paying for them? Of course, because it's something that's so important. Um, and I've not I've not seen that happen off of their office a social worker or part of his own back it's been when the solicitors are saying it so that's so just all, all too common is that it's down for the young person who's you know just to sort it out themselves and often they don't have the ability to do so or the financial resources to be able to do so um so just wanted to give a couple of examples of um cases which um exemplify the problems and some possible solutions um, that maternity action has referred to to me um, they've they've so a couple of clients similar to the circumstances I've described so two two women who came as unaccompanied asylum seeking children looked after by local authorities um, for different reasons didn't have their immigration status sorted out um, once they were 18 years old one reason was because the local authority failed to make sure that she had the 17 and leave till she was 17 and a half and got that extended. Another one was unable to find um, an, immigra an immigration legal aid solicitor. Um, and so they, they, they then had a couple of years without leave to remain. And during that time, they gave birth and have got had fees of five, six, seven thousand pounds maternity debt that they were unable to pay. And they were being pursued by the hospital and by debt collectors for this. For this payment, um, I was able to. Um, thanks, Roz. Um, I was able to challenge the local authority. Fortunately, successfully. I mean, there's no specific statutory duty to say that the local authority has to pay for immigration advice or has to pay for you know someone's maternity debts if they're a child that's been in their care. But we were, I was able to threaten legal action, and they backed down on the basis that had they met their duties under the Children Act and under um, the corporate parenting principle, then they would have helped this, these young people regularize their immigration status and they wouldn't have had this debt. So it was a direct responsibility, direct fault of theirs. Um, you know, those, those young women were fortunate to be able to get in touch with the maternity action to refer them to a solicitor, but there'll be other women out there who haven't, haven't got that and are being pursued for these debts because of failings by local authorities. Um, I'll just end up another example. And so, as I said, that is, you know, my view that local authorities should be compelled to pay for immigration advice for care leave, as we have been able to get that done successfully. Um, so I think I think it is worth worth the try. But it was um, you know, the young person, a care leaver. He um, had really bad immigration solicitors. Um, I think they they withdrew his appeal from the tribunal without telling him, without his instructions. Um, he found out, was able to get it get it reinstated, um, and we we he wasn't. Able, I think there was no legal aid for the type of appeal he was pursuing, and we got the legal aid. Sorry, we got the local authority to agree to pay a private immigration solicitor for advice merits, which was at least fifty percent, so positive. And then we got them to continue to pay for his case, and he's now got leave to remain. So, you know, I, I guess I was once preparing this talk, thinking, oh, it's all you know, it's quite gloomy, and it is. You know, that, and that's by design. But I think for care leavers, you know, it's it's worth getting legal advice to see if, if there's a way into challenge it and getting maternity or other healthcare debts written off. 
Thanks very much, Sasha. Um, it's, it's nice to be able to end on a, a positive case um, in a very difficult space, I think. Our next speaker is uh, Shushin Lu from Daddy Street Chambers. Shushin. Um, I wanted to take um, a, a step back from the domestic charging regime to put the regime in context um, of the UK's international human rights obligations. Um, and obviously where children are concerned, um, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is the obvious starting point. And Article 24 of the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child provides firstly that state parties recognise the right to the child of the child to um, the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health and to facilities that for the treatment of illness and rehabilitation of health. And more importantly, um, it um, encourages state parties shall strive to ensure that no child is deprived of his or her right of access to such healthcare services. And the second limb of Article 24 is that state parties shall pursue full implementation of this right, and in particular shall take appropriate measures, including to diminish infant and child mortality, to ensure um, the provision of necessary medical assistance and healthcare to all children. Um, and there are other, um, other aspects are listed in that. I mean, there's a lot of shall do this, shall do this, not may. Um, and I think that's quite important. And obviously, Article 24 needs to be looked at um, together with other rights and obligations under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, including the one that's probably most familiar to people, um, Article 3, which is the best interests of the child as a primary consideration. And I've used this a lot um, in my um, casework, but I'm never really focused on um, the explanation of what um, best interest could include um, under Article 3, um, because it, it describes, goes on to describe that um, best interest should be based on the children's physical, emotional, social and educational needs, age, sex, relationships with parents, care caregivers and their family and social background. But of course, there's also Article 6, which is not just about the inherent right to life, but also the state party's obligation to ensure to the maximum extent possible the survival and the development of the child. And then there's Article 2, which is the duty to respect and ensure that rights of to the child is um, without discrimination of any kind, including the, um, irrespective of the child's or the child's parents' nationality and their legal status. Now, the Committee on the Rights of the Child, um, general comment number 15 on the right to health, um, also stresses um, and repeats this idea that health and related services should be accessible to all children, pregnant women and mothers in, um, in law and in practice without discrimination of any kind. And in particular, um, in the context of charging, it says that um, the lack of ability to pay for services, supplies and medicines should not result in the denial of access. Uh, and the committee has called for, um, for a very long time, called for states to abolish user fees and to implement um, health systems that do not discriminate against women and children on the basis of their ability to pay. So with that context in mind, um, I just wanted to look at three aspects of the, a few aspects of the charging regime that obviously don't live up to these obligations. Um, and the first is the residence requirement. I mean, there is a single definition of an overseas visitor who is chargeable for NHS care, and that is people who are not ordinarily resident in the UK for NHS services. And then Lona has already given the headline point that children are not exempt, but I just want to have a quick look at exactly what that means and how it affects different categories of children. So the definition of ordinary residents for purpose of NHS charging is limited by constraints introduced in the Immigration Act 2014. So there's two limbs to this. First, um, the person's nationality or immigration status. And then secondly, the factual circumstances surrounding their presence in the UK. So section 39 of the Immigration Act 2014 excludes temporary migrants from um, who have been granted limited leave, um, such as to study, work, join family in the UK, and those without leave from the definition of ordinary residents. So basically, your first limb is you have to be someone who has British citizenship, Irish citizenship, who has a, a common travel area exemption, people with ILR to remain to satisfy that immigration status limb of ordinary residents. 
And you can see that um, the, there is an immediate impact on children because unless they acquire citizenship by birth, they wouldn't satisfy this even if they are born in the UK. And I know that Simon's going to pick up on that issue in more detail. Um, the second limb is the place of actual residence. The test derives from a House of Lords case called Shah that a person is ordinarily resident in the UK if they're living here in the UK lawfully and adopted residents here voluntarily for a degree of settled purpose for the time being. So a person can be, in principle, ordinarily resident in more than one place, um, and they can also be ordinary resident from the first day of arrival in the UK if they have a genuine intention to settle. But the criteria, the critical criteria is lawful residence. Um, and children don't have much say or control over their immigration status. Their status is parasitic on their parents' status and depend on their parents' conduct. So even if um, children are born in the UK, but are born of parents with precarious immigration status, the current regime as set up means that they will still be captured by the charging regime. And this is even though this outcome obviously is at odds with the accepted proposition in international human rights law that children shouldn't be blamed or rather they shouldn't be penalized in this context for the conduct of their parents. And particularly when applying the principles that best interest shall be a primary consideration. So residence is one problem from a child's perspective. But a, a second problem that I would suggest is that children's healthcare needs in the context of NHS charging aren't treated differently or, or and, and aren't all treated as immediately necessary or urgent. Um, and if you look at that in context of the general comment number 15, which says that children's health care is intrinsically linked with their, not just their physical, but their psychological, emotional, social development. So, um, you know, to, to distinguish between different kinds of health care needs for the purposes of um, requiring upfront payment um, before provision of health care for a child um, would, in that sense, potentially um, have the effect of restricting children's access to health care, contrary to Article 24 of the UNCRC. I mean, the third aspect is that even if children are themselves treated as ordinary resident, um, most can't avoid the impact of NHS charging because of their parents' position. And, and Lona has already you know, canvas this about child poverty being a contributor to poor physical and mental health, reduced employment opportunities in the long term, social deprivation and social stigma. Um, debts from healthcare costs can exacerbate existing poverty and push pre previously coping families into destitution. And from that perspective, it's difficult to see how that kind of consequence of NHS charging would be consistent with Article 3 of the UNCRC in terms of the best interest as a primary consideration. But it's not just, um, and this is my fourth point, it's not just a problem for healthcare outcomes. Um, these detriments are also a child safeguarding issue. Um, fear of immigration um, enforcement, um, fear of charging, um, and fear of the consequences of potential removal and deportation uh, may deter families from healthcare and that means that children as a whole, um, these types of children as a whole, um, may be invisible and more hidden um, from, from the public eye. Um, it could um, affect opportunities that are missed for identifying and safeguarding vulnerable people. And, and I think uh, ultimately, um, the, a fundamental problem with um, the NHS charging regime as it affects children is that um, it treats immigration status as a static matter for the purposes of NHS charge, so that um, it doesn't reflect um, the idea that there's a, a whole swathe of people who are subject to charging, including children, who actually are not health visitors, as I said in opening, um, and are people who um, can and will contribute to society. But the NHS charging regime is creating a hostile um, way in which um, they have to suffer destitution, safeguarding concerns and detriments to their health outcomes before they ever reach the point where they are free from this regime. And so, so that's sort of looking at it from a child rights perspective. It's difficult to see how these implications would necessarily not uh, comply with um, the UK's um, obligations um, under the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. 
Thank you. I know I've finished a little early, but. Thanks very much, Yushin. No, that's, that's a relevant philosophy. Our next speaker is Simon Cox from Dowdy Street Chambers. Simon. Thank you very much, Roz. Uh, hello, everybody. And um, thank you to the previous speakers for covering so much of the ground so well. And in particular, I thought Xu Xin's fantastic, uh, albeit depressing, uh, introduction uh, to the subject. So um, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully that will allow you to see the notes. Let me just, oh, sorry about this. Uh, there we are. Right. hope everybody can see um, the note that I have there. So what I want to talk about today is um, the uh, uh, possibility of charging children who are born in the UK and uh, the argument that that is uh, not possible or will not be possible in the vast majority of cases of, of children born in the UK. So um, we're gonna, I want to take you in a moment to the, the detail of the law. Uh, um, because I just think it's helpful for everybody to, to have an opportunity to understand that. But I, before we do that, I just want to set out that the five points that I'm um, going to try and show you from um, the primary legislation, the secondary legislation. The first is that charges can only be made for services to a person who is not ordinarily resident. So that's what the NHS Act says. It doesn't allow for um, the government to make regulations uh, um, to impose charges on someone who is ordinarily resident in the UK. Uh, secondly, um, the Immigration Act, as we'll see, tells us that persons who require leave to enter or remain and do not have it or have limited leave are deemed to be not ordinarily resident. So that's the second injunction from Parliament. Those people uh, are not ordinarily resident and that is why they can be subjected to the charging regime in the regulations. Uh, and the third point is, that ordinary residents otherwise means lawful residents. Um, and I'll take you, Shushin's already mentioned um, the uh, interpretation of ordinary residents that the courts are given to that phrase. Um, the primary legislation does not define ordinary residents, except uh, this uh, deeming provision in the Immigration Act. Uh, and it does not allow for the regulations to define ordinary residents. That is a matter of interpretation of the Act of Parliament. And so then we see the two second points that I have there on the secondary legislation. They can't impose charges beyond the primary legislation, but as we'll see, they do exempt some children born in the UK. Though, as I'll be explaining, I think on a proper understanding of the scheme, that exemption should very rarely be needed. So um, turning then to the, um, sorry, there we are. <clears throat> so who can be subject to charging? Um, the uh, um, National Health Service Act 2006, Section 175 uh, provides uh, that regulations can provide for charging, doesn't require uh, uh, there to be any charging. The Parliament hasn't told the government that they have to charge people for NHS services, it's just given them the option of doing so. But Parliament limited that uh, under Section 175.2 to services that are, are provided under the NHS Act and that are provided in respect of such persons not ordinarily resident in Great Britain as may be prescribed. So that's two tests there. The first is they have to be not ordinarily resident in Great Britain. The second is they have to be prescribed. In other words, they have to be defined in regulations as chargeable. But both of those conditions need to be met for there to be a charge uh, on a person. Then in 2014, the Immigration Act uh, um, provides a deeming provision uh, uh, under that uh, section that we've just been looking at. Um, and it says in section 39.1, a reference to persons not ordinarily resident in Great Britain includes, um, without prejudice to the generality of that reference, I'll come back to what that means. Um, it includes a reference to, first of all, persons who require leave to enter or remain in the UK, but do not have it. And secondly, persons who have leave to enter or remain in the UK for a limited period. So we can see from that, that a person who does not require leave to enter or remain in the UK is not a person who falls under section 39.1 and is therefore not a person who is deemed by section 39.1 to be not ordinarily resident. Uh, so, for example, a British citizen does not require leave to enter or remain in the UK. They are therefore not deemed by section 39.1 uh, to be uh, um, 
uh, not ordinarily resident, even though they don't have leave. They don't require it. There are other groups of people who are exempt from immigration control. They are also not deemed uh, to be not ordinarily resident. Um, the phrase in the uh, uh, second line there, uh, without prejudice to the generality of that reference, means that a, a person can still count as, or, as not ordinarily resident, even if they aren't deemed by Section 39.1, if on their particular facts, they're not ordinarily resident. So, for example, a, a person who is a transit who's transiting the UK as a British citizen, who has no home here, no other connections to the UK, has only been here for five minutes, might not count as ordinarily resident, even though they don't require leave to enter or remain. Now, the uh, uh, application of that to children born in the UK is conditioned by the holding in the Court of Appeals judgment in Akinyemi uh, that a non-British child born in the UK who's never left the UK does not require leave to enter or remain. Uh, and, and that's because a, a person requires leave to enter or remain in, in the UK um, if they are coming to the UK from outside the UK. A person who is already into the, in the UK, who, if you like, entered the UK by birth, is not someone who required leave to enter the UK by birth. Uh, the, the child didn't commit a, an illegal act by being born into the UK. Uh, the child would have committed an illegal act if they'd entered the UK uh, um, secretly uh, uh, by a boat or a lorry, but they don't uh, commit an illegal act by entering the UK by being born in the UK. And so they don't require leave to enter or remain. And that's the long-standing Home Office position. And I've quoted there the guidance, and the guidance is quoted in full in Akinyemi. Um, <clears throat> that while children who are not British citizens don't have the right of abode and are subject to immigration control, they're not in the UK unlawfully, and they're not required to apply for leave to remain. In other words, they don't require leave to enter or remain. So a child who's never had uh, uh, leave to enter or remain in the UK is not someone who requires leave to enter or remain if they were born here. Now, once a child has been granted leave to enter or remain for a limited period, then they will be deemed to be subject, to be uh, not ordinarily resident. And we have that, I've gone back under 391B. They're persons who have leave to enter or remain in the UK for a limited period. So a child might apply for leave to enter or remain, or might even just be given it without applying by the Home Office. If that's for a limited period, then they fall under 391B. But until they actually have leave to enter or remain, they don't. Um, and clearly, if, maybe not clearly, but anyway, uh, if a child is given limited leave to enter or remain, and then, and then uh, that leave to enter or remain expires without them having applied to extend it, then they are somebody who requires leave to enter or remain. They have committed the illegal act of overstaying their leave, but that doesn't affect a child who's never had any leave to enter or remain. So, who is or is not ordinary resident? Uh, as Xu Xin has already mentioned, uh, um, and as he set out in the Department of Health and Social Care's guidance, uh, um, the government's approach, despite some reconsiderations of what ordinary residence means in other fields, like in uh, Ch Children Act proceedings, um, still follows the 1983 judgment, living lawfully in the United Kingdom voluntarily and for settled purposes as part of the regular order of their life for the time being, whether of short or long duration. And for those of you who haven't read it, uh, uh, Shah concerned, concerned students, concerned overseas students in the UK who had uh, limited leave to be here. Uh, and the House of Lords said that they uh, uh, were ordinarily resident. Um, so it, it's not the case that ordinary residence is something that requires any particularly long time uh, to be here. Uh, and while each case will depend on its facts, it does seem to me that generally speaking, if a child is born in the UK uh, uh, and doesn't have any uh, immediate plans to leave the UK, um, that they are, or, or plans made by their parents, that they're ordinarily resident in the UK for the time being. That's part of the regular order of their life, uh, whether of short or long duration. Um, the NH, the Department of Health's guidance accepts that there's no minimum period of residence. Uh, it's in the past suggested that six months is a minimum, but uh, it, it recognizes that that isn't required by ordinary residence. 
And it also recognizes that ordinary residence isn't determined by that of somebody else, uh, that one person's ordinary residence isn't decided by somebody else's ordinary residence or behavior, though, of course, it, it may be a relevant factor. Uh, um, and that's why I say it's not uh, determined by that of the parent. Now, that doesn't mean uh, uh, that a child born in the UK uh, is necessarily ordinary re ordinarily resident. Uh, again, a child born in the UK uh, may, uh, with their parents, have plans to leave the UK tomorrow. Uh, uh, and it may be said that, therefore, they're not today ordinarily resident. Uh, but a child of a parent who's been living here for years uh, and who wants to go on living here, uh, and, for example, has applied to the Home Office to regularise uh, the parent status, um, it seems to me that it would be uh, very, very hard to describe that child as not ordinarily resident. The parent has made plans to remain in the UK, and those plans currently uh, are underway. Those plans may be to regularise the parent's unlawful status, uh, but as we've already seen, the child isn't unlawfully in the UK, the child is lawfully in the UK. Lastly then, what about the exemption in the regulations? Well, uh, as we've seen from the primary legislation, um, the uh, uh, Secretary of State has a wide uh, judgment about who to make charges to, sorry, who not to make charges to uh, amongst the cohort of people who are not ordinarily resident. Um, and so uh, we see the exercise of that power in Regulation 25.3 and a very specific exemption uh, for a narrow class of children born in the UK uh, to certain parents um, who is aged three months or less, who's not left the UK since birth. Um, as I've already explained, there may well be children uh, in very unusual circumstances who are not ordinarily resident in the UK uh, because of their particular facts, uh, but this regulation means that they would not be uh, chargeable. What this regulation doesn't do and can't do is deem that a child uh, who is aged more than three months and has not left the UK since birth uh, is uh, unlawfully present because they don't have leave or uh, that they're not ordinarily resident. And the reason that the regulations can't do that is because those are matters set down in primary legislation, which doesn't define ordinary residents and which limits the deeming provision in the Immigration Act to people who require leave to enter or remain or who have limited leave to enter or remain. The deeming provision does not uh, uh, apply to people who do not require leave to enter or remain. Uh, and that, as I've mentioned at the outset, is for a very obvious reason uh, um, that the largest class of people who don't require leave to enter or remain are British citizens. Um, and so the uh, Act would have been structured very differently uh, if it was intended to limit uh, uh, the protection of uh, um, the primary legislation, for example, to people who have indefinite leave to remain. That's not the structure of the law. And we see that in, um, we go back to that text. It's a, the structure is to deem certain classes of people as not ordinarily resident. And I say that because uh, in the uh, um, case of SHU, uh, which I will just, pop up on the screen. Well, for your notes, if I can, um, that might be hard. Uh, I can't do that. Anyway, um, in the case of SHU, uh, which is 2019 EWHC 3569, uh, the divisional court uh, received from the claimants a concession uh, uh, that the uh, applicant did not qualify uh, as uh, uh, for, um, sorry, was subject to charging. Uh, because they did not have indefinite leave to remain. And we see that in paragraph four of that judgment. Um, my view is that concession was wrongly made. That isn't what section 39.1 says. Uh, I think it must have flown from an a misunderstanding uh, uh, that there was a class of people who, uh, um, that, 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 that everybody who's not British requires leave to enter or remain. And as I've explained, that's not uh, correct. Uh, and we see that from the Court of Appeal in that kingdom. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. That's a fantastic overview. We are now moving to questions at the end of the panel. Um, can I ask people to put their questions in the Q&A rather than the chat? Um, 
we will be working directly from the Q&A. So rather than putting your hands up or anything like that, if you could uh, put them in the chat, that would be very helpful. Uh, and forgive me on my throat, I'm afraid of <laughs> managing a cold today. One of the first questions we have is in relation to disabled people. Um, Anne Galpin asked for speakers' views on NHS charging as a disproportionate impact on undocumented disabled people, especially disabled women and disabled children. And um, would any of the panel members like to comment on that? Um, I mean, the... Oh, sorry. No, go. On. Um, I think I think it's a really I mean it's a really good question, but uh, I think it's a really difficult one. Um, as so from from what I know about um generally kind of statistical information on um on the population, it's not possible to say definitively what proportion of of children, for instance, um have a disability or whether they are caring for a, a parent who who has a disability. Um, the the kind of the national data surveys and administrators data that records this kind of information, for instance, the um, Department for Work and Pensions will publish child poverty statistics where they'll say how many uh, families have children who have a disability or where parents have a disability. Um, but none of those data sets have something um, which would would tell you what somebody's immigration status is. So there's no way to make a kind of direct link. Um, the Home Office, there was um, there were some talks around. We were trying to to work with officials to try and get a question into the Family Resources Survey, which generates that data, which would have um, a question around kind of visa status. But unfortunately, um, it didn't happen. Um, so it, so there's there's a limit. I mean, I think there's the there is sort of um, a lot of uh, qualitative research which looks at the experiences of asylum seekers and refugees and and um and the kind of over representation of of disability and long-term health issues among that population um but i think anything that sort of that could break it down um like that in, in quantitative in a quantitative sense isn't isn't available thanks thanks very much i don't know um i i don't know if that's I don't know, definitely it's not recorded, but I know we, we did a, I had a case a few years back in terms of it was challenging lack of provision for accommodation from the Home Office to disabled people waiting for their asylum claim to be decided. And the Home Office just didn't record the number of disabled people it accommodates. Um, and that was in 2020. And I, I've, I've, I've been trying to push them. And then they were found to be acting unlawfully for not, not monitoring the needs of disabled people to accommodate numbers of disabled people they were accommodating because then they, how could they know um, what the needs were and meet them? Um, but I've I've done FOIs and in litigation asked for um, information about what's, what the Home Office has done since then to stop being unlawful and I haven't had any any responses at all. So I don't know if that information, or it's the information not, not co collected in that way I don't know if it's collected in, in the way that Anne's asking either I mean I guess you can do an FOI I'd, I'd be, be surprised if it was collected um just to come back on that I did um so I through the research that I'm doing on children and families who are receiving asylum support I have asked for this kind of information and they I think the kind of response they normally come back with is um that they I think it's in manual it's in within documentation but they don't they don't sort of centrally collect it um so so it would it doesn't meet the kind of the cost um threshold uh for them for them to kind of produce it but it's definitely something that through because a lot of for instance the kind of the work that um the unity project have done in relation to no recourse to public funds highlights that um quite a large proportion of their kind of case work is with families where there's a family member with a disability who isn't able to access um yeah benefits and uh and and so those will I think those will be relevant. Thanks. Can I just say that I do think the Home Office is very vulnerable on, on um, the PSE duty to be properly monitoring and to gathering data. <laughs> I mean, they are a tiny, incompetent, sort of marginal policing department that has stumbled into a field of providing services like asylum support and has become the tiny little tail that wags the government dog. And they're just not up to it. They just don't know what they're doing. Um, so I do think that pushing them hard on this stuff 
is is um, and they know they don't know what they're doing. That's well, that's I mean, why they that's why they don't answer because the people inside know that they're rubbish, uh, and they just do not want to get dragged into this stuff. Uh, but I do think that politically, the challenge is not to make the Home Office better. It's to take these functions away from them and to get them back into the hands of civil servants who don't have a policing mindset and who are, who are who have trained and thought about how to provide services to disabled people, how to provide services to women, not how to deport people. That, so I do think that that's the challenge is to prize it away from the home, home Office. And I think that when we do that, we have allies in government because I think the rest of government finds it very hard to deal with the immigration department um, and we'd much rather they were out of their lives. Thanks very much. I, um, sorry, I just I just put the name of the case in the chat as an answer to Anne's question on the failure to monitor the needs of disabled people. So if anyone wants to have a look, they can see it there. Lovely. Thanks. Thanks for that. We do have some questions coming through which are quite detailed descriptions of cases. I don't think it's appropriate to have those coming up to the panel at this point, unfortunately. I think it'll absorb the time we've got available for questions to deal with those specific cases. We had um, a general question here um, from Greg. Greg Drotkin, does Simon's talk mean that there are substantial numbers of charges to children born in the UK which could now be challenged? Simon. Yes, loads. Okay, that's a very <laughs> crisp uh, And I answer. should say that um, um, I'm instructed by uh, Janet, Janet Farrell, who I think is on the call uh, um, um, at Bat Murphy uh, in a potential judicial review of um, an, a trust that is, is refusing to drop the, or, ha or is failing. To drop the charges uh, a, a, against the child. So very much a watch this space situation. Oh yes, definitely. Lovely. Okay. Uh, again, I think we've got some of these questions are quite detailed queries. Um, So what is the situation for a child of parents with pre-settled status under the EUSS who don't apply for their baby status within three months? After three months, does their being chargeable or not depend on whether they've left the UK? And how does that sit within NHS charging regs? Simon, I think that's for you. So the, 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 the view that I've expressed about the way the scheme works applies to everybody, uh, um, regardless of, or every child born in the UK regardless of the status of their, their parents. Uh, um, there may be additional arguments. So in a judgment I, in December, the um, upper tribunal decided that the Home Office's current scheme under which people who have PSS and don't apply for an extension will become overstayers, breaks the withdrawal agreement. So there may be extra arguments that one can put forwards for children covered by the withdrawal agreement uh, who don't have leave to remain. Um, but um, at the moment, I would suggest that they're not necessary uh, because of the Home Office and the court's position that those children don't require leave to enter or remain. Yes, and I, the same, I think there's a question there about Windrush uh, children. Um, uh, yes, I, I think again there it's useful. So if you have, um, so I, I imagine there's a situation when, when, when you have people born in the UK who are then um, accused of not being British on the basis of their parents' own status. Um, so, I mean, I had a client, for example, who was 21 and had never applied to regularise his status because he believed he was British. Um, the Home Office disputed he was British, as it, they then backed down and accepted he was British. But it did turn on some complicated stuff about when his parents had married and where his father had been and so on. Uh, um, so I think if you have clients who turn out to never have had any leave to enter or remain and to have been here without leave to enter or remain the whole time um, because they didn't leave the UK, then I think this argument will apply to them. Thanks, thanks very much. There's a question here. Is there any research evidence showing the impact of NHS charging on health outcomes, more quantitative rather than qualitative findings? I don't know. I think that one might be. Um, yeah. I did spend quite a bit of time looking for things. Um, I think I think what the problem is, is we're back to kind of the, the data issue in the NHS. Um, data that's produced doesn't have anything specific to immigration status. So um, I think the most um, the most of, of what surveys kind of capture our country of birth or or nationality um, 
but but they but they don't have immigration status so that's a difficulty i mean um there is I think what uh, I found really interesting in the last few years is, is kind of working with um, people who, who are statisticians who, who do kind of quite interesting research where they can take existing information and, and kind of make a series of assumptions um, about it. So I think there is um, there are some plans to look at that in relation to health. So there was a there was a paper by the education. Sorry, this is a bit of a tangent, but I, I find it interesting. and Maybe others will as well. There's a paper by the Education Policy Institute published in 2021, which basically um, uh, did this kind of thing for the national pupil database data, which also doesn't have a kind of refugee or migrant flag on it, but they were uh, by using kind of country of origin, um, language, um, and I think location data for where people were dispersed to, they were able to sort of isolate potentially um, families, children and families who who would be asylum seekers or resettled refugees and make some um, make some kind of inferences about their educational outcomes. So they're, I think they're, they're looking to do the same kind of thing with health outcomes. Um, but uh, in short, I'm not aware of anything specific which um, which kind of can definitively make those links currently, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Liana. It does seem to be a substantial gap in data um, for the health system to not be able and I to think, you know, look at the impacts. Really, is really intentional um, because I mean I think I think it's very interesting that for instance while we had the development of the hostile environment we didn't really know um, who the hostile environment was going to um, affect or the kind of profiles of people that would be affected by these policies um, while at the same time we had the modern slavery act legislation where there was some investment in trying to find out um, who victims of, of modern slavery were at the time there was a real kind of different approach um, and in, and I think it's interesting that only now in 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 recent in the last year we've had these sort of publication of um, statistics on small boat crossings after a decade of hostile environment policies aimed at kind of tackling irregular migration. Um, and what what the kind of the the documents that the Home Office have published last last um, month, which include a kind of literature review of the impact of the hostile environment, um, what what it, it research there is does show that the kind of negative consequences um, of these measures. Mm, thank you. Thanks. Uh, we have a question from Raya Feldman um, on the legal points raised by Simon, and she asks, how likely would it be that overseas visitor officers or the hospitals would know these points of law and how would they find out unless the hospital was legally challenged? What else can chargeable patients do? I'm sorry, I, it is arcane, Raya. I'm happy to send you a copy of the notes, so uh, um, perhaps with more consideration it becomes less arcane. I actually don't think it should be arcane. I think it's pretty straightforward. You're not, you're not chargeable unless you need leave to enter or remain. People born in the UK don't need leave to enter or remain. That, that's it. Um, it isn't in the NHS guidance. Uh, um, possibly partly uh, because, as I've said, I think the Home Office is so difficult to talk to. So people just stay away from them. The Home Office doesn't issue regular bulletins to other government departments on updates in immigration law relevant to their fields or anything like that. Not that kind of government department. Um, so I think it's really hard for people in the Department of Health uh, to get to get kind of straight on this. Um, and I think it would probably take either a judgment from a court on this issue to lead to them amending the guidance or advocacy from organizations like Maternity Action uh, uh, and Doctors of the, uh, of the World and other groups to try and persuade the government to change the, the guidance. But I don't think advocacy will probably get them to change the guidance. Um, of course, the guidance isn't binding. Trusts have to apply the Act to Parliament. Uh, and so, they can be presented with this same legal argument uh, directly by patients, uh, and I think should be. And I'm, but I'm afraid the remedy is the, the legal remedy, the judicial remedy is judicial review of the trust. Uh, but there are also independent, uh, internal and independent complaints mechanisms for NHS decisions. And it may be that um, people who, for example, uh, um, are not eligible for legal aid because of their income, but wouldn't uh, want to spend the money on a judicial review, uh, um, or for other reasons that want to bring a judicial review, um, could invoke the complaints procedure. It might even be that eventually a, a decision from the Health Service Ombudsman uh, prompts a rethink by the Department of Health uh, uh, if there isn't a judicial review judgment in the meantime. Um, there may not be a judicial review judgment for a long time because trusts tend to concede these kinds of cases. 
uh, rather than allow them to go to an expensive full hearing uh, that they will uh, that they may lose. Uh, so so uh, I think we should be pushing this forwards on all those fronts, uh, judicial review, advocacy to the Department of Health and using complaints procedures. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. I think that, that sounds like a useful breadth of work to try and prompt change. It's certainly the experience of maternity action. If you want to make changes in the guidance, it's not a straightforward process, um, particularly when you have the conceding of, of decisions that would have given you the compulsion for the DH to revisit their guidance. Um, I think I had a question actually that I was going to ask um, Shushin. Um, in her talk about the international law dimensions, a question of child safeguarding came up and the idea of charging as being fundamentally a, a safeguarding issue. I was just wondering if you could expand on that. Um, well, I mean, we know from a lot of the research, at least on maternity care, that, you know, it has a deterrent effect charging um, so that um, parents or women don't seek um, treatment um, when they need it until um, it's absolutely necessary or urgent. Um, for children, um, anyone with children will know that they will, they frequently need to have contact with the health services. De de deterrence um, prevent, and it, it's not just a way of improving health outcomes, but it's also a mechanism, um, implicit mechanism by which children's welfare are checked. And so if you um, have children whose parents and who also themselves feel they're unable to seek help for their health needs, um, they fall out, out of the radar um, of health visitors, of um, GPs, of hospital um, you know, prof health professionals. And that, that is a safeguarding issue um, where it concerns child trafficking, child sex abuse, or any kind of child neglect, um, because health services are a mechanism by which oftentimes these issues are detected. So children becoming more invisible um, is a safeguarding issue. You know, we, we think about it in health outcomes, but I, I would like to think about it more as a safeguarding issue um, because they are hidden. But then destitution also um, is a safeguarding issue and not just a health outcomes issue. So it, it's about how we frame it um, from a child rights perspective as opposed to um, a migration perspective, I think. Thanks, thanks Shishin. Um, I also had a question for Sasha. Um, you've given a case where you did manage to persuade a local authority to pay privately for immigration advice, obviously one in which very, very poor advice um, previously. Um, what is it that you would recommend to others um, to try and persuade the local authority to take that responsibility? Yeah, well, specifically for care leavers, um, it's, to, to peg it to so that their needs for education, employment, um, maybe it's impacting their health. Yeah, so so there are there are very clear duties for care leavers to achieve education, employment, training outcomes, and if they can't meet those outcomes because of their immigration status, I think that's a very good you know way in to say we need to help them get their immigration status sorted out on the basis of the corporate parent principles as well as well as the leaving care duties. I think I think if the young person didn't have any education goals, training uh, employment goals at all, it would be more difficult. Um, but I'd probably need to look at another way in. I don't know, Shushin, if you, if, I mean, if, if it's a kid who happened, I mean, you usually can get them to have some aspirations. And I think if they have, then that would be a way in to so say they need to have their immigration regulars to meet those goals. Thanks for that. Did anyone want to add to that? Yeah. Uh, just to say, I've been instructed in several cases by local authorities to advise on um, the, 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 the uh, looked after child's immigration status. And, and I think one way to encourage local authorities to do it, maybe at the advocacy level, is that they're often um, supporting the child from their own funds. Whereas if immigration status is uh, resolved uh, uh, or can be argued for on the basis of legal advice, the child can access, uh, an older child can access universal credit or other forms of support. Thanks. Thanks for that. 
I'm looking at the questions and we have quite a few questions which are about very specific cases. And again, I think we might we might not look at those um, just again because I think we'll end up in more detail than we we can usefully explore here. One question that came up earlier was about campaigning for change and about the need for really fundamental um, collaborative work from lawyers and from campaigners, from community organisations. I'm interested in the views of the speakers around that, about how we actually push for a shift in the law policy and guidance on this issue. It's a big question, I know. Um, I mean, I, I think I think maternity action and the likes of Doctors of the World are already, you know, doing a lot. I mean, this is an area when you, um, you know, do a Google search of NHS charging impact and briefing or whatever keywords, um, you you come up with loads of um, briefings and position statements um, calling out the detrimental impact of NHS charging, um, and and this is an area you know where you've got pretty much all of the Royal Colleges speaking out about this and speaking out about it quite consistently, including and the BMA um, doing so. I think what we're lacking at the moment is political will to change um, and political language. Um, because, I mean, you and I have done work on litigation in this area. Um, and the idea is, this is why I started in the keynote, is the difference between equality and e equity, because um, they will say, well, it's it's only fair that um, people who don't have leave um, need to be charged. It's only fair that the way that they should be charged applies to everyone. Um, it, it, there's no analysis um, from a disability point of view. There's no analysis from a sex discrimination point of view. There's no analysis from the intersectional point of view. And, and the height of the analysis to date is that hostile environment evaluation that recently was published. For the first time, it that for the first time is the government's acknowledgement of the disproportionate impact on women. I mean, it's taken how many years to even get to that? Um, but that's a very cursory analysis because that doesn't tell you the kind of treatment types, the the where the disproportionate impact arises, and the sort of secondary victims such as children, um, and sort of long term detrimental outcomes. And so it, it, it is. A matter of political will, it seems, and um, because their campaigns are there. I mean, we read about it all the time. <laughs> I don't know. That might be a very cynic's point of view. <laughs> Thank you, Shishim. Um, would any of the other panel members like to comment? No, like it's a big question. I know I'm trying to create change in an environment that we have at present where it seems to be a key area of government policy to be as restrictive as possible in relation to some very vulnerable migrants. It is a challenging space for campaigning. Um, I'll just look at the questions again. We have quite a few questions which are about very specific issues within charging, um, about um, engagement in campaigning and so on. I think what we'll do is put some links in the chat to um, some of the resources that are available in this area to answer some of the very general questions that people have raised, because um, I know there are resources out there which cover those. Um, and uh, we'll be taking a break for 15 minutes, coming back at 11.30. So thanks very much to our panel members. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone, I hope you had a good break. Um, we'll now be restarting um, the conference and we'll be moving on to panel number two. Panel number two looks at the impacts of the charging regime in the areas of unlawful detention, barriers to settlement and failures of the exemptions. We have four speakers in this panel, Christine Benson from Maternity Action, Dan Squires Casey from Matrix Chambers, Nat Big P from Lee Day, and Rebecca Chapman from Garden Court Chambers. Um, as in our first um, panel, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section and we'll come to them at the end of the speakers. Uh, I'd now like to welcome Christine Benson. Thank you, Roz. Um, Michaela, please could you share my slides? Thank you. Um, 
As Rod said, um, my name is Christine. I'm an immigration asylum solicitor and I head up the NHS charging team at Maternity Action. And so in panel one, there were quite a few individual questions about cases people are working with. So if you have any questions about um, NHS charges for maternity care and you want those cases taken on for casework or you just want some initial advice, we'll send through how to contact our advice service after the event um, and then have the opportunity to talk about individual cases there. Now, I've um, called this section, when is an exemption not an exemption? Because unfortunately, that is how the NHS charging regulations are operating in practice. So I want to take you into a deep dive through Regulation 9. Um, next slide, please, Michaela. OK, so Regulation 9. And when the NHS charging regulations were redrafted in 2015, they were drafted to include provisions to protect vulnerable groups. Um, and so some of those vulnerable groups are exempt from charges. And we know that these are refugees, asylum seekers and victims of, victims of trafficking. However, it was also acknowledged that vulnerable groups included survivors of violence and that they should be exempted from NHS charges for care that were for care that was caused as a consequence of that violence. Safeguards were int introduced for survivors of torture, sexual violence, domestic violence and female genital mutilation. For the past five years, Maternity Action has provided a casework service for women who've been charged for their maternity care. And one of our um, casework criteria are women who have been subject to domestic and sexual violence. And today what I'm going to talk about is the interplay between the sexual and domestic violence exemption and maternity care. As Xu Xin um, explained at the beginning of today's seminar, um, there are approximately 600,000 undocumented people living in the UK. And when the government was drafting the charging regulations, it was those undocumented people that were in mind who would potentially benefit from the NHS charging exemptions. And the, char the, non the chargeable groups are primarily refused asylum seekers, um, people who've overstayed visas or those who are in the UK um, because of illegal entry. And it's this group of women that we're going to talk about, the undocumented community. Um, next slide, please, Michaela. And I first of all wanted to put this domestic and sexual violence in context. And so the rape crisis um, in 2022 um, issued their annual stats um, and 70,633 rapes were recorded by police in the year ending September 2022. In that same period, however, only 2,616 charges were brought. Um, one in two rapes against women are carried out by their partner or ex-partner. Five in six women who are raped don't report to the police. And as we all know in this room, um, conviction rates for rape are at an all-time low. Um, next slide, please, Michaela. And so putting undocumented women at the heart of our discussion today, there are additional significant barriers to disclosure that means that undocumented women do not report to authorities. And I just put a few of those reasons down. So less likely to report because of fears of being removed from the UK because of their lack of immigration status, um, racism, institutional racism in the police. Immigration status is often used as a tool to exacerbate domestic violence. So women are told that if they do report to the police that their partner will ask the police to deport them from the UK. There's very minimal access to refuge spaces for those with no recourse to public funds um, and homelessness and destitution are a real risk if the woman leaves her partner and reports. And then finally, there's the, the concern about social services intervention in the family and what that potentially will mean. Does that mean the child will be taken into care if they have um, if they report to the police? Next slide, please, Michaela. So given this context and what is known by government about the unique vulnerability of undocumented women, let's take a closer look at Regulation 9 and how it operates in practice. Maternity action represents women subject to sexual violence, and we argue that Regulation 9 should be applied and the woman exempted from NH charges, NHS charges for the totality of her maternity care. Um, the government overseas visitor teams have the regulations 
and guidance issued by the Department of Health to, to consider, but they also seek guidance from NHS ENI and the Department of Health on more compli complex cases. And by complex cases, um, our experience is that the majority of Regulation 9 cases that we um, make submissions on are, are escalated to either NHS ENI or the Department of Health. Now, the overwhelming response of overseas visitor teams across England to our casework has been one of disbelief when receiving a woman's account of violence. That's even where evidence of domestic violence and sexual violence is recorded on the woman's health care records by the midwife. Um, overseas visitor teams state that further evidence is required to prove that conception was caused by domestic violence or sexual violence. Now, clearly, evidencing that conception was caused by sexual violence is challenging for women. Overseas visitor teams have suggested that the only acceptable evidence is a rape conviction, which going back to the um, stats produced by rape crisis is extremely, extremely unlikely. Sexual violence in relationships is a complicated area for lawyers to take instructions on. When a woman is pregnant and in a relationship where the pregnancy was caused by sexual violence, there are feelings of shame, yet hope that the relationship will repair, and also a reluctance to accuse the father of their child of being a rapist. As a team of immigration asylum lawyers, We've decades of experience of taking statements from women about sexual abuse, but there is something far more complex when taking instructions about intimate sexual violence in a relationship. We've learned to listen carefully to what is said, what is not said, as well as what is said. For example, does the woman have a GP? And if not, why not? Was it that the GP didn't allow her to register or was she not allowed to seek GP care and access contraception in that relationship? One question that we've learned to ask is, does the woman have a key to the property that she's living in? And so many times the answer is no. And th thus begins the unfolding of the complex relationship of violence that she is either living in or has lived in. And then we turn to agency in the relationship to say no to sex. And does she have that agency? And women, when they have their first meeting with their midwife, they're always asked whether the pregnancy was planned and whether there is any domestic violence in that relationship. However, busy midwives um, often rush through that question or women accompanied by their violent partners. So there's no real space, therefore, to talk through their experience. And these are complex experiences. Um, next slide, please, Michaela. Um, Actually, can you move to the next slide? It should begin, um, Samira, because I want to talk to you about two cases that Maternity Action has acted for in order to illustrate exactly what the, the issues are. So Samira um, was a client of mine. She had overstayed her visa and began a relationship with a British citizen. Her parents and his family approved of their relationship and they quickly began living together. However, after they started living together, she learned that the man was also in another relationship and he brought the woman and his child to live in their home. And from then on, Samira was subject to severe and ongoing domestic violence. Her partner raped her repeatedly. Uh, eventually, Samira fled to a refuge where she discovered she was pregnant. And um, she had to have a medical termination and was flagged as being chargeable for her care and invoiced. Samira was accompanied to every appointment by her support worker from the refuge she was staying at. The address she gave was of a woman's centre known to the hospital as being the care of address for women accommodated in this refuge. Samira's ex-partner was arrested and unusually the police charged him with rape. However, she was never told about Regulation 9 and instead the invoice for several thousand pounds was issued to her and escalated to a debt collection company. Two years later, Samira contacted Maternity Action. Um, we provided the overseas visitor team with evidence of the arrest and charges, which were later dropped. We provided evidence that Samira had been living in a refuge at the time she received her care, and we asked the trust to apply Regulation 9. And what we had here was what we thought was a very straightforward case where we couldn't imagine that the overseas visitor team wouldn't apply Regulation 9. But what we received in response to our legal submissions and the evidence we submitted was um, a response from the overseas visitor team asking 
for further evidence. They said, the police custody document that you have attached states there was insufficient evidence to proceed and no charges were brought. Can you advise if there is any further police action? They asked, is Samira receiving any mental health input that would help us support the domestic violence claim? Now, we were able to go back to the overseas visitor team and make further submissions. We also had a telephone conference with the team to discuss Samira's case. And as a result, the overseas visitor team did agree to withdraw those charges. But what I'm illustrating here is that even where the facts and evidence are clearly there, the regulation is still not working for women. Samira was not told about the exemption, and even when legal submissions were served, further evidence and further hurdles were put in Samira's way. Um, next slide, please, Michaela. Um, let's move on to Carolina now. Um, Carolina, um, she lived with her partner and had done since she overstayed her visa. Um, her partner was violent. Um, sexually violent as well, and she was afraid to say no to sex because it would re result in further violence. There was a history of controlling behaviour and extreme jealousy in that relationship. She didn't have anywhere else to live, but during one incident, the police were called by her neighbours and they then made a referral to social services. The social worker was allocated and then Carolina started to get the support that she needed when she was pregnant. Um, her partner had come with her to all appointments with her midwife, and that continued until he became abusive during one appointment and was then told he was not allowed to the hospital or in the hospital grounds. The midwife team were made aware of social services involvement, and they also attended safeguarding meetings about her older child. Carolina was charged for her maternity care. Maternity Action made submissions that Regulation 9 should be applied. The process of taking instructions from Carolina was long and complicated. She had been subsequently accommodated by the local authority under Section 17, but was finding living alone without any family support extremely isolating. She didn't have any money and she was considering returning to her ex-partner. Despite Regulation 9 being drafted to protect women like Carolina, when we served the submissions, they quickly refused. Um, and what came back from the overseas visitor team, next slide please, Michaela, was, was very interesting and sort of fits with um, what Simon said earlier on this morning about the interplay between um, immigration and other departments and how the Department of Health and overseas visitor teams have become um, home office enforcers. What the um, overseas visitor team wrote back to us was, a, was quoted from um, NHS e and i and they said, 9F is widely misunderstood by maternity teams and charities. The exemption is for the treatment of a condition caused by torture, FGM, domestic violence, or sexual violence. And they said, to illustrate the point, being in an abusive relationship does not make someone exempt from charge. Being treated for injuries from domestic violence is an exemption from charge for treatment to those injuries. And they go on and say, being pregnant when you say sustained a broken arm doesn't make you exempt from maternity costs, only for the treatment to those injuries. Next slide, please, Michaela. And um, being a victim of domestic violence is not a global exemption, they were keen to say. It applies only to treatment for a condition caused by it. So counselling for the emotional abuse will be free, but having a baby isn't. And there we are. There's a clear failure in government to understand how domestic and sexual violence and intimate partner relationships operates. And if we go back to those earlier statistics, one in two rapes against women are carried out by their partner or ex-partner. Five and six women who are raped don't report the rape to police. The unique vulnerability of undocumented women to violence is therefore further exacerbated by the safeguards that are designed to be in place to protect them. Going back to Samira, she returned to her partner. She couldn't manage financially and she, she decided to return to that relationship. But what I would like to leave you today though is with a sense of optimism. Um, the casework that we carry out has resulted in a body of evidence about the failures of Regulation 9. And the fact that there are so many of you in, are in this room today, um, virtually, listening to how the, e these exemptions are not working gives me hope that there's going to be more creative legal work and challenges made to hold Department of Health and individual NHS trusts to account. With each case like Samira, we report the approach taken by the overseas visitor team to the Department of Health, so they're unable to continue say that the safeguards that are in place are operating. 
We also work with overseas visitor teams to highlight good practice and raise poor practice. So if you're working with an undocumented woman who's had a baby since 2015, it's highly likely she'll have been charged for her care. Be curious, explain that there are exemptions and ask about the relationship she was in. Be ready to challenge by judicial review if you have a legal aid contract and be ready to fight the legal aid agency if they refuse funding. Nat and Rebecca are going to speak later about the, challenge, the changes to the immigration rules and the implications of having outstanding NHS debt. There should be no longer any reason for the, for the legal aid agency to refuse funding to challenge NHS charging decisions, given the likelihood that settlement will be refused. Thank you. Thanks very much, Christine. That's, that's, that's a very bleak picture that, that you've painted. Um, we now have Dan Squires, Casey. Dan is from Matrix Chambers. Um, I'm just trying to start my video. Oh, there we go. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I, I th thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm going to, uh, if things, things weren't bleak enough, I'm going to talk about the connection between um, NHS charging and, and unlawful detention, uh, and in particular, uh, the connection uh, with unlawful detention under Schedule 2 of the Immigration Act. Um, uh, Schedule 2... Uh, it is a power that's given to immigration officers to stop and detain people who've arrived in the UK. Um, and it applies to anyone at all who uh, arrives in the UK uh, by ship or aircraft. Um, and the purpose uh, of the power is incredibly broad. It's, it's to check whether a person's a British citizen, and if not, um, to check whether they have leave to enter. Uh, and if they do have leave to enter or remain, uh, to examine whether that leave should be curtailed. Um, and anyone who's required to submit for an examination under Schedule 2 can be detained. And uh, on one level, the power in Schedule 2 is, is entirely unremarkable. Um, we're all used to being subject to it if we go through an airport and if we're British citizens presenting our passport to be examined is a Schedule 2 examination. And to some extent, because the power seems uh, so unremarkable, there's been very little judicial consideration of it. Uh, but actually, it's a really striking power um, because uh, it's a power, as I say, that mil millions upon millions of people can be subject to. And in relation to non-citizens, uh, the power is incredibly because it can be used, as I say, to check in any circumstances whether their leave uh, to enter or remain should be curtailed. Uh, and there's no need for any prior suspicion or any reason to think that curtailment uh, of leave to remain or enter is likely. If any person can be stopped. It's up to the immigration officer. And furthermore, there's no limit in the statute to how long people can be detained when they arrive. At port and come in a moment. We've had cases of people being detained for hours, but I think for some cases up to eight or nine hours. Um, and the reason that it's striking that there hasn't been any legal challenges to the use of the power is that ordinarily uh, powers to stop, detain, question people require some kind of suspicion. Ordinarily, you can't stop people in the street uh, and detain them. Uh, particularly detain them for indefinite periods. Um, and there are very, very few contexts in which those sort of powers to, to detain and question without any suspicion are permitted. And while the courts have held that those kinds of powers aren't necessarily unlawful, um, they have to be accompanied by particularly stringent safeguards. There's a series of cases um, both in Strasbourg and domestically, in which the courts have considered suspicionless stop um, and question powers. In relation to all of them, they've held you have to have some sort of code of practice explaining when the powers are going to be operated, safeguards uh, against arbitrary use, possibilities uh, to review or complain about um, the exercise of the powers. And What's striking about the powers under Schedule 2 of the Immigration Act is that there's no regulatory scheme at all. There's no published policies, no indication on what basis immigration officers can decide 
who to stop, how long they can be examined for, on what basis, uh, no indication, um, what criteria are being applied. Um, and, and as far as we know, um, no statistics kept as to who is stopped uh, in terms of their race, uh, in terms of their sex, um, no independent review to ensure that the powers aren't being used in a discriminatory manner. And I say that's despite the fact it's an area where there's an obvious risk of abuse. And I say we we have seen cases of detentions of mothers with young children, including breastfeeding mothers for, for, for hours without food and drink. Um, very vulnerable individuals being detained at port for, I think we've had a case of up to eight hours of, of detention. Um, so that's scheduled too, and you might be thinking this is all very interesting, but what's the connection with NHS charging? Or you might be thinking this is not very interesting and it has no connection to, to the NHS charging. Well, well here's, here's the link. Um, for the last couple of years, I've been working with um, Xu Xin, who you've heard from, and also uh, Janet Farrell from Bat Murphy, who is in trouble with online seminars, I'm sure is, is lurking here somewhere, uh, on uh, detention at ports of those with NHS debt. And what um, Janice and Chuchin in particular found, I think with, with maternity action as well, um, were lots of cases of women with NHS debt being stopped at airports, uh, detained for, uh, in, in many cases, for hours, and questioned about what they were doing to pay off the debt, explain they needed to pay them off uh, before they're allowed uh, to enter the UK. And what's so striking about that is many of these women had leave to remain, which had been given to them after they'd acquired the NHS debt and the debt had been considered when uh, the leave was granted to them. Um, and what that meant uh, is that the fact of the woman's NHS debt could not be a basis for cancelling uh, their leave to remain or enter. And that means, at least in our view, I'll come on to this in a moment, that all of those stops and detentions were unlawful because the only basis on which a person can be lawfully stopped, questioned and detained under Schedule 2 of the Immigration Act is to decide whether their leave should be cancelled. And here, the NHS debt, asking the women how they acquired the debt, how they intended to pay it off, couldn't form a basis for cancelling uh, their leave to remain. And Following further digging, what seems to be happening is this, is that the Home Office has an unpublished policy of stopping detaining and questioning anyone uh, arriving in the UK with NHS debt, irrespective of whether they have the right to remain here. And the policy, furthermore, is that that stop should be used to remind people of their debt, ask the people how they intend to pay it off, to tell them the debt needs to be repaid, and to pass on contact information to the relevant NHS trust. And it's clear that the purpose of those uh, stopping and detaining people uh, has got nothing to do with seeing whether their leave to remain should be cancelled. Because I say the NHS debt at this stage is simply irrelevant to that. It's clear the purpose is to assist with the collection of the NHS debt and, I suppose, potentially with a broader a uh, hostile policy, a uh, hostile environment policy. Uh, and, and, and we have evidence, again, it comes from maternity action, of debt collection agencies threatening those with unpaid NHS debt. But one of the consequences of not paying the debt is being stopped and detained at airports. Um, so we've seen, seen one letter from an agency that says, if you already have a visa or from a country that does not require a visa to enter the UK, you may be detained by the UK border agency while re-entering the UK. Now, our view is that this is clearly unlawful. None of those are proper purposes uh, of the use of uh, immigration detention powers, um, as well as being uh, detention pursuant to a, an unpublished policy. Um, and we have... Um, cases going ahead to challenge it and, and um, we have a two-day judicial review uh, at the beginning of May which will hopefully uh, succeed in establishing um, that, that the practice of the current policy uh, is unlawful. And what this illustrates um, beyond uh, as well as the way in which the, the NHS debt uh, provisions are used not just directly to create a hostile environment, but also indirectly through the connection uh, to unlawful detention. 
And it also illustrates, it seems to me, something broader about um, the dangers of having, or the dangers of the um, Schedule II powers themselves, the dangers of having powers to stop um, and detain people without any proper safeguards. Um, because the risk is this, um, the risk is that you end up stopping people if you don't have a clear published criteria, if you don't have uh, proper monitoring, if you don't have proper routes to challenge uh, um, detentions of this sort, is you have the risks of people being stopped for impermissible purposes. For example, uh, putting pressure on them to pay NHS debt. You also have the risks of immigration officers um, stopping people uh, because of discriminatory policies or practices. Um, and for example, um, the NHS debt, um, as I'm sure people know, is, is something that disproportionately affects women because of the link to maternity. So if you have a policy of stopping and detaining people because of their NHS debt, you will be disproportionately uh, stopping uh, women. Um, and the risk is particularly acute in, in this context because you have a cohort of people who are unlikely to complain about it. As I say, everyone entering uh, at the UK is in theory subject to Schedule II powers. But if British citizens were routinely being told for three to four hours at airport without any proper explanation or justification, I suspect things would change pretty quickly. But it's the fact that people who are detained and examined uh, have precarious immigration statuses um, and are likely to simply accept that kind of treatment or just be so relieved uh, that they're released at the end of it, that they won't want to put their head above the parapet. And so these things aren't challenged. Uh, as I say, the, um, our view is that the practice of routinely stopping people with NHS debt uh, is itself uh, unlawful. And hopefully um, that is something we'll be able to deal with uh, through the courts. But I also say, uh, but I also think this is actually uh, part of a, a significantly wider problem, which is that Schedule 2, that this particular form of immigration detention, the Schedule 2 port stops, are likely to be unlawful in a series of other uh, kinds of cases. Because as I say, this form of suspicionless stop in all other contexts requires um, sufficient safeguards to ensure that it's not being used arbitrarily uh, disproportionately, that there are proper criteria, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it seems to me that beyond uh, the NHS debt context and more widely in terms of the way um, migrants are treated, um, it, it is an area which I think it, it is worth exploring further as to how those powers are used. Because I say there is an argument that they are routinely being used unlawfully, uh, no doubt it seems to me in terms of NHS debt, but um, but probably in, in a series of other areas as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dan. Our next speaker is Nat Bickby from Lee Day. Nat. Thank you. Um, so as Christine mentioned, uh, what I'm going to talk about today um, and, and Rebecca after me is the impact of the charging regime on migrants' ability to settle in the UK. Um, and here by settlement, what I mean is uh, getting indefinite leave to remain in the UK, i.e. no longer having um, a limit on the length of time that you can be in the UK, but also having um, a lot less conditions um, on, on, on your right to stay so you no longer have um, any, any limitations on your right to access benefits, your right to work, your right to access the NHS and so on. Um, but just, just before I dive in into the new rules, um, as several speakers have highlighted before me, the NHS charging regime is very much part and parcel of the hostile environment. And as, as, as Shushin um, said before, I, I, I also refuse to call it the compliance environment. Um, and in this, in this context, the Home Office has not only made it difficult for people without leave to access secondary health care, they have also made it difficult for people to regularize their leave um, once they want to do that. Um, 
if they have previously accessed secondary health care at a time when they didn't have the correct immigration status. And they have made it difficult by introducing uh, grounds of refusal where you can be refused um, entry clearance, tourist relief or indefinite leave to remain if you have a pending debt to the NHS. Um, in terms of um, who can be refused um, on the basis of, of, of a pending debt, um, it's, it's most uh, categories of leave that are included, with some exception, including uh, protection claims, um, Appendix EU, Appendix Ukraine scheme uh, is not covered, um, and then the S2 healthcare visitors and service providers from Switzerland. Other than that, mo all applications, um, all, all applicants can be refused leave um, on the basis of a, a pending debt to the NHS. Um, and just in very general terms, um, you can be refused uh, leave if you owe a debt um, of a thousand pounds or more if the charges were incurred uh, between the 1st of November 2011 and the 5th of April 2016. If the charges were incurred after the 6th of April 2016, then it's sufficient to have a, a debt of um, over £500 uh, to, be, to be refused. Um, for EA national seats for charges incurred after the 1st of July 2021. Um, and the, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning those dates, um, and, and I think Rebecca will, will come back to that, is, is just to uh, point out that you, you, you always want to check when the charges were incurred, because if they were incurred before the 1st of November 2011, then um, a, a refusal on that basis would, would most likely be unlawful. Um, now, with that said, just looking at the practice, um, and I'm focusing on, on, on applications on the basis of family life and private life here. Um, what I have seen so far are refusals either of entry clearance, um, or, and I'll talk about this uh, later, of indefinite leave. Um, I have very rarely, well, I have never seen, uh, I'd be interested to, to hear if others have, I've never seen um, a refusal of further leave to remain, um, so of, of limited leave, to, of an application for limited leave to remain submitted in country, um, even when there are debts to the NHS. Um, and, and the reason the Home Office can do that is because they, the, the refusal uh, ground is, is discretionary. And their own guidance says, um, give a, gives a list of examples of when they will refuse and when they won't refuse. Um, and one of the examples is um, an applicant has applied to remain in the UK on the family route. They incurred the debt after overstaying their previous visit visa. The applicant has a British child and is applying to remain in the UK as a sole carer for the child. It is likely to be appropriate to grant the application. Um, and just going back to what Dan was saying earlier, there are people who come to the UK with, with leave um, and despite having, having um, debts and the Home Office knew that about those debts at the time of granting them leave. Um, so, so, so that has been my experience. Further leave to remain in country uh, on the basis of, of family and private life, not really um, refused. I have seen people getting refused um, at entry clearance stage, though. Um, now, what is worrying is, is a recent change in the rules, um, which came. So it's a statement of change that was introduced in March 2022, and that came into force in June 2022. And what was introduced um, is uh, two appendixes, um, which are appendix private life and appendix settlement family life. Um, and they cover people who are on the 10 year route to settlement uh, that was introduced back in July 2012. So we came to the 10 year anniversary, so people started uh, being eligible to apply for settlement under those routes. Um, and what seems to have gone slightly unnoticed is a change in the suitability requirement, because what it now says uh, for those routes is that an application must be refused if um, there is an NHS debt of £500 or more. Um, so it's, it's a significant change because, unlike applications for further leave to remain, the, the ground of refusal here seems mandatory and not discretionary. Um, 
the the, the rules are as 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 the home office will often do uh written in a very complex way but um what they seem to say is that the debt um and all the grants of refusal so you can be refused for example if you've been involved in a in a sham marriage or if you've used false information before um those grants can be overlooked if the applicant has completed 10 years continuous residence in a human rights route. And out of those five years, um, well, five years have passed since the suitability ground uh, came to the attention of the decision maker. Uh, now, I read that to mean that if your NHS debt had been known to the Home Office four or five years, and you've accumulated 10 years local residence, um, then you, you might still be granted indefinite leave. Um, however, the guidance, the, the, the guidance that the Home Office has 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 uh, published to accompany those, those rules seems to suggest that that's not um, the approach they're taking. And they're quite clearly differentiating between um, a refusal on the basis of an NHS debt and a refusal, for example, on the basis of sham marriage. Um, so for sham marriage, they quite clearly say, um, where the five years continuous residence, so they've count five years continuous residence from the date of the first grant of permission since the sham marriage was discovered. And if those five years have passed, then they will grant. However, then they go on to say, for applicants with outstanding litigation debt or NHS debt over 500, the applicant will normally be refused settlement. And they don't, uh, they, they don't include any proviso saying if if a certain amount of time has passed, we will still grant. So it seems that the approach is is refusing uh, when there is a debt over five hundred pounds, uh, however long it has been uh, since they've known about the debt. Um, Warring the guidance also goes on to say uh, that. Uh, well, or rather doesn't say anything about uh, applicants who have a repayment plan in place with the NHS. Um, so for, for for further leave to remain applications, the guidance is quite clear that if there is a repayment plan in place, uh, then they won't refuse the application on that basis, even if uh, the debt might still be over £500. But they haven't said uh, that uh, for, for a settlement application, and they just say um, the applicant as soon as the applicant pays the debt in full, uh, they will be eligible to apply for settlement. Um, now, thankfully, I suppose <laughs> the, the silver lining is that they're not just going to refuse, well, they will refuse settlement, but um, provided you meet uh, the rules, they will grant further leave. So um, applicants will, will still have leave to remain in the UK, but they won't have um, indefinite leave. And what it, it means is that people are just going to be stuck on a loop of having to um, extend uh, and, and yeah, just keep having limited leave to remain without ever being able to get to indefinite leave to remain um, until they've, they've been able to pay debt. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just go through a case study just to illustrate uh, the real impact on real people uh, of those changes. And it's um, I suppose, an, an, an indication of what we might start to see uh, more and more. Um, and it's, it's, it's a case study that was shared uh, um, by Maternity Action, so, so thank you for that. Um, and it's a case of, of a woman called Blessing, who applied to the Home Office for her third tranche of limited leave to remain on the 10-year route to settlement. Um, the Home Office grants her leave, but with the letter granting her leave, they notified her that she had an outstanding invoice. Um, well, she had three outstanding invoices with three NHS trusts. Um, and this was the first time ever that Blessing had heard um, of that outstanding debt. Um, the Home Office goes on in the letter to tell her that if she hasn't paid the amount in full by the time she applies for settlement, um, which she is eligible to do in, in two and a half years of time, then she won't be eligible for indefinite leave, and instead she will be granted a further period of limited leave. Um, and, and, and Christine will, will uh, correct me if I got this wrong, but again, it doesn't seem that the Home Office is saying uh, 
that she can pay the 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 debt in full or enter in a repayment plan in the sense that the, the, the only will allow um the application if if she's paid it in full. Um now when Blessing went to maternity action, um she said she had never seen those invoices, she had never received them, um, and she herself tried to contact the NHS trust, but she wasn't able to obtain that information. Um highlighting that even if you want to try and do something about it, 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 it is difficult uh, to even get hold of those invoices. Um, Maternity Action uh, wrote to the NHS Trust uh, on behalf of Blessing and they 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 got them back. So Chelsea and Westminster raised an invoice for her maternity care in 2015. Um, and that was an invoice for care that she had received five years earlier in five years earlier in 2010. Um, and it was sent to the address where she lived in 2010 um, and, and no longer lived there. Um, Sandra's NHS trust charged her for surgery for her child, um, and the child had it in 2013. Um, and uh, worryingly, the invoice was issued to the mother, uh, despite both parents being present during the care. Um, so there seems to also be some 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 discriminatory treatment here, uh, where it's it's mother who who tend to receive um, the invoices rather than fathers. Um, in total, the the invoices amount to over fifteen thousand uh, pounds, which, as I said, the Home Office expects her to pay within two and a half years. Um, now, Blessing is a woman on a low income. She's responsible for five children. Um, it's it's the likelihood of her being able to repay that um, is is obviously extremely unlikely, um, and what that means in practice is that her tenure root settlement, which is of course already a, a, a really long uh, route to settlement, is likely to become uh, a lot closer to fifteen twenty years or or more. Um, so so just to conclude, um, it's. It's likely that we're going to see an increasing number of women um, and, and, and other individuals who discover outstanding debt when they apply for settlement only. Um, and they might be very well be unaware of, of those charges uh, because of changing addresses or because the invoices are raised uh, way after the charges were actually incurred. Um, obviously, we haven't, we, well, Again, I'd be interested to hear if if someone has seen a refusal already. Um, I suspect there hasn't there haven't been uh, many or not none at all because this is a route. Well, this the the indefinite leave um, provisions were only introduced um, mid last year, and so there's going to be going to have been very few applications so far. Uh, but it is worryingly, and I think that we are going to see an increasing number of individuals who are stuck on um, a loop of, of limited leave to remain uh, because they can't repay those, those enormous debts. So just to conclude, a call uh, to everyone, as, as, as Shushin also said, to uh, monitor what happens um, and also to put our thinking hats on uh, and think about how we can challenge this. And I will leave on to Rebecca to actually think about some challenges. Thanks. Thanks very much, Nat. So, yes, we'll move now to Rebecca Chapman. Rebecca's from Garden Court Chambers. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nat, and also Christine and Dan. Hello. This, um, this is a bit of a sort of mopping up session. Uh, I've been asked to talk about the impact of the regime and the potential challenges to the refusal of settlement and provide what are hopefully some helpful tips. As Nat indicated in her talk, to some extent this is inherently speculative because the newest provisions that we're mainly focusing on only came into force in June of last year. And so I'm not yet aware, neither is Nat, of any decisions that have been made refusing settlement on the basis of an NHS debt. This does not, of course, mean that there aren't any. And if you have one, please say something in the chat and we can discuss uh, generally afterwards. But it means really that the I've been thinking about potential challenges on general public law grounds and also ways of trying to perhaps uh, preempt a refusal depending on at what stage 
uh, your client, the applicant, is made aware that there is an NHS debt. So firstly, just to look at the provisions themselves. So historically, there has been a discretionary um, rule under the general grounds of refusal 9.11.1 to uh, refuse an application where there is a debt of at least £500. And that was also contained in Appendix FM since July 2012 uh, under the suitability requirements SILR 4.1 and 4. SLTR 4.5. However, as stated, those were discretionary. Since June of last year, there is now a mandatory refusal on the basis of an NHS debt of £500 or more. Uh, that's PL 12.4D of Appendix Private Life and SETF 2.4 of Appendix Settlement Family Life. Uh, these are both new provisions. The guidance has also been updated to reflect that. So the guidance was most recently amended on the 8th of December last year. Uh, it's version three, it's entitled Suitability Debt to the NHS. The starting point is, is that it's uh, discretionary, that's with reference to the previous provisions and refusals whereby, for example, you can take account of an applicant's particular circumstances, their family circumstances, illness and ability to pay a debt, financial circumstances, and other compelling or compassionate circumstances. But at page 19, the guidance makes clear that in settlement applications made on the basis of family or private life, that refusal grounds on the basis of an NHS debt will result in a refusal of settlement or a variation to consider the application as permission to stay. So what, what can we do in, by way of representations, uh, pre-action protocol letters and judicial review applications to, to combat these new and horrible provisions? So I think the first thing, the devil being in the detail, is if, if you have a, a client that comes to you uh, with a, a refusal on the basis of an NHS debt, I have a, a small checklist of things to check. So firstly, when was it that the medical treatment was received? Was it before November 2011? What was the immigration status of the person at the time of the treatment? What was the nature of the treatment? Was it exempt? What was the amount of the debt? Whether in fact the debt is accepted, and this is important bearing in mind that the burden of proving that there is a debt is on the Secretary of State for the Home Department. If there is a debt, is there a payment plan in place or is a payment plan possible? What was the nature of the application? Are there compelling or compassionate circumstances or human rights considerations? If the debt was in relation to treatment from a child, has the decision been taken by a senior caseworker, not a normal caseworker? Has the child's best interest been considered? And if the debt relates to someone else who's a dependent, but not the applicant, then the applicant's application should not be refused just that of the dependent. So picking up on some of those points, in terms of the debt, has the applicant actually received notice of it? I think both Christine and Nat referred to incidents where the debt letter, I would like the notice of debt, was not in fact served on the applicant. Um, it may be that it was sent to a previous address or served on the other parent, perhaps in circumstances where they are no longer together. Um, in those circumstances, it's worth drawing attention to the case of Anu Frijeva. This was a decision of the House of Lords from 2003, UK HL 36, Lord Stain at 26. And his Lordship held, notice of a decision is required 
before it can have the character of a determination with legal effect. The constitutional principle requiring the rule of law to be observed requires that a constitutional state must accord to individuals the right to know of a decision before their rights can be adversely affected. So that's one thing to check. Another thing is to actually look at the reasoning that's been provided. Um, is what is the actual basis? Is it a general grounds or is it under one of the new appendix private life or family settlement uh, applications? Is it discretionary or is it mandatory? I also think there is potential for a challenge to the fact that there is disparity or inconsistency between the fact that some routes are discretionary and some are, are mandatory, i.e. under Appendix FM and the five-year route, the general grounds would apply and therefore any refusal on the basis of NHS debt is discretionary, not mandatory. What is the rationale for the fact that with the new appendices, uh, refusal on suitability grounds on this basis is mandatory? Also the fact that those appendices have been given retrospective effect. As Matt said, we're now just past the 10 year anniversary uh, in relation to the rule changes in July 2012. It is now, of course, far too late for the applicant to do anything about having access medical care historically. Arguably, the fact that there is no discretion built into um, those paragraphs also means that the exercise of the caseworker's residual discretion is unlawfully fettered. Another point to check is whether Section 55, the best interest consideration, is engaged due to any knock-on effects of, of children of any parents who, of course, are the ones that are liable for any treatment received by their child, or indeed indirectly because of the debt in relation to their parent. Um, this brings me to the case of SHU. This was referred to earlier by Simon in a slightly different context. I was hopeful when I began looking at all of this that there were discrimination arguments that can be brought. And I am not going to resile from that position, but I do need to draw attention to the case of SHU. That's 2019 EWHC 3569 admin. And this concerned a Ghanaian national who had entered illegally in 2004, then gave birth to a daughter who needed and received a life-saving liver transplant and subsequently was naturalised as a British citizen. Uh, the case was heard by Mrs Justice Foster, who noted at the outset that the issue was whether the charging regime, which fails to provide retrospective exemption in respect of the debt, represents unlawful discrimination or whether the immigration rules were ultra vares or irrational in taking into account the existence of the NHS debt when considering leave to remain. The judge rejected all arguments, unfortunately, uh, finding that it was justifiable for the Secretary of State and for the hospital to draw a distinction, or well, the NHS Trust to draw a distinction between those uh, who had ordinary resident status and those that did not, um, and, and also rejected the case on the grounds of what being ultravaries or irrational. Notably though, and this may be where the case can be distinguished, it had been recognized in advance of the litigation that the applicant was destitute and unable to pay the debts, which were in excess of 100,000 pounds. And the Foundation Trust exercised discretion to write off the debts and did so. So that slightly changed the dynamic in terms of particularly the engagement with Article 8. The case was um, very well argued and it was put that Article 8 was engaged because of the impact on family life, uh, which was undermined um, by the, the, this enormous debt and that family life included a home life underpinned by a degree of stability, practical as well as emotional, 
and by financial resources adequate to meet basic needs, including accommodation, warmth, food and clothing. So we are back really to the very beginning of what we were talking about today in relation to the hostile environment and the level of poverty that is proven from research to exist amongst the migrant population. And this is a very clear example of that in practice. So whilst there is, in terms of that case, it's very unhelpful, but in terms of the future, I don't think that one should necessarily shy away from at least considering whether discrimination can be run, Article 14, read with Article 8, on the particular facts that might be before you in an individual client's case. Um, further points just to consider whether the PSED can be run, um, again, particularly given, as I understand, the full Home Office review that resulted in the maternity action claim not uh, succeeding has never been fully disclosed. And so to get disclosure would be helpful as part of judicial review proceedings. And um, one other potential challenge group that uh, may have arguable grounds is fiancés. So as a fiancé, you are entering on a route for settlement rather than being just a marriage visitor. And you are permitted to switch into partner leave after marriage. However, during that period of time, the initial uh, six months or until marriage, up until the point when partner leave is granted, you would also be liable to be charged. And I think that's potentially challengeable. Um, as I stated at the outset, I'm, I've not had any cases directly on this point. What I have had is a case with by analogy really, which was in fact successful. And this is someone who again, due to the statement of changes to the rules, had a historic uh, conviction and sentence of more than 12 months, 29 years ago in another country. And due to the change in the rules, there was a mandatory refusal of his application for settlement. Uh, we sent a pre-action protocol letter, the uh, defendant maintained her position, we then lodged judicial review grounds raising discrimination, ultra-varies rationality, in fact, all the points raised in the SHU case. And the Home Office uh, conceded uh, once the judicial review was lodged and granted the applicant ILR and his dependents. So it is, of course, on the basis that you have funding worth considering judicial review challenges um, to these decisions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rebecca. Lots of interesting ideas for us to have a look at, I think, there. Okay, we'll now move to questions. And I think there's been a few questions um, put in the Q&A. Just a reminder to people, if you'd like to ask a question, put it in the Q&A rather than in the chat. Um, question from Rada Ruskin. I don't see why anyone with 10 years residence on family or private life grounds couldn't just apply for ILR under the long residence rule in part seven of the immigration rules, rules 276A and 276B. Am I missing something? Who would like to take that one? Um, I can. I agree. That's a really good point. Um, uh, my suspicion is that they are going to extend those grants of refusal to be mandatory for all for all reasons. Like, I think they'll catch up with that loophole. But that is a really good point uh, for now. Um, I think the only time where I can I can see that being an issue is in terms of continuous residence, because for a uh, long residence application, you, there's a limit in terms of the absences you can have had, um, which now does apply for appendix settlement um, for yeah, settlement family life and private life, but only for absences uh, that happened after June 2022, i.e. when they were introduced. So there might be uh, some applicants who were out for too long and uh, are not eligible under the long residence rules. Uh, but other than that, yes, I agree. Um, I, I, I think the Home Office will catch up with that, but for now, yes, we should absolutely rely on those rules instead. Great, thanks very much. A question here. Um, I'm hoping that your, and I think that's Rebecca's, uh, NHS charging checklist for those applying for ILR will be shared. Um, Rebecca, I hope you're happy to have that included with the papers after the 
Sure, today. I'll do that. Great, thank you. A uh, question from Raya Feldman. If a charge is written off by a trust on the grounds of destitution, which does sometimes happen, does the debt still remain in place and so can it be invoked in order to refuse a person's settlement? Um, yes, Raya, it, it can. Yeah. So um, when a debt is written off, it's for accountancy reasons. Um, that's how the NHS trust, trust justifies it. So it affects, so the debt no longer affects their balance books, um, the balance sheet, sorry. Um, and when we've had clients who've had debts written off, we ask the trust to update the home office. However, they they don't, trusts don't, and therefore the um the debt still remains on that person's individual home office um, record. And that's why we always say that a write-off is a, is a sticking plaster in the short term while somebody is undocumented and destitute. But once immigration status is granted and once people get themselves um, in, a, in a better financial situation, repaying the debt is always, is always the best way to minimize any potential issues or any potential immigration law implications. Thanks very much, Christine. Question from Greg, Greg Dropkin. Doesn't the guidance, which is not the law, merely give trusts the option to report debt to the Home Office rather than requiring them to do so? I think it comes from the NHS Act 2006, Greg. Um, I think that's where the source of law comes from. So I think it's not just in guidance, but I'll, I'll double check. And if that's not right, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay, and Shadin from Project 17. Wondering about debt incurred for treatment for children and whether this can be used to refuse children ILR at the end of the 10 year route or the five year if the young person's people's concession is used. Is this something people feel able to answer? Uh, yeah, I think it can. Um, with, yeah, I, yeah, I think it can. Um, but as, as Rad has uh, pointed out, uh, they might want to consider applying uh, under the long residence rule. Great, thank you. Uh, a question from Peggy, protect our NHS and patients, not passports. Can people supporting women anywhere in the country contact Maternity Action for help? Um, Peggy's a retired midwife and child volunteer birth companion for vulnerable migrant women and doesn't have direct contact with birthing women now, but is thinking of trying to signpost busy practicing midwives. Uh, towards support for women who might be affected by charging. Uh, Christine, perhaps you could answer that. Yes, we take um, queries from midwives, health visitors, as well as lawyers and individual women and family um, from anywhere across the UK. A okay. uh, question from Rachel. Um, I feel the overseas department from experience are highly inadequate. It's become ever so difficult to communicate with them and to write off a penalty notice. When challenging the debt, clients continue to receive notices that have increased. This, of course, causes some considerable amount of stress and, as mentioned, barriers to access in healthcare. Also, HC2 certificates are not being automatically renewed, so clients are unaware that their certificates have expired. Um, any advice would be much appreciated. Absolutely agree. It's what we see in our casework every day. Um, even when there are outstanding submissions and we put on record that the person is vulnerable um, and that trusts should make sure that their debt collection companies don't um, contact the person now that we're in dispute of the legality of the charges, they still do. And we send repeated emails. Um, we have found that PALS as a complaint route isn't um, satisfactory. We've started um, complaints to the PHSO. Unfortunately, the initial responses to those have not been satisfactory either. Um, so it, we have to keep on making noise about it. And what we've done instead is, um, as an organisation, arranged meetings with um, NHS trusts and people quite senior in trusts where there are um, systemic issues. And that seems to be the way to get people to listen because the people who were working in the overseas visitor teams um, don't don't listen to don't listen to us. Thanks, Christine. Uh, what kind of evidence would we need when challenging charges for treatment of injuries due to the violence exemption, such as torture? Christine, perhaps you could answer that one. 
Um, so if your client is at um, receiving therapy from freedom from torture, is there um, any evidence from the clinician there? Um, is there any information in their asylum statement, in their asylum interview notes? Have they been recognised as a refugee? But I'd also flag, though, to consider Regulation 6 of the 2015 regulations, which says if the person was in the UK um, for the purpose of claiming asylum and received treatment, so care they received before they made their asylum claim, that could be an alternative way to look into this if that's when the need for charges arose, if the trust, so you could make a twofold argument, regulation nine plus regulation six. Um, you know, we'd be happy to answer questions on, on that point if, if there are individual cases that come up, do contact us. Ros, you're on mute now. There always has to be someone who does it. Um, I had a couple of questions that I was going to ask. Um, Dan, you mentioned that you're running a challenge with Janet Farrell. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's a challenge to uh, um, a number of individual stops of um, women with NHS debt, um, but it raises a whole series of wider issues about whether there's an unpublished policy to stop women in, in that position, but also more generally about airport stops and what the what the criteria are, whether there are any published criteria. Because I say, well, a striking thing about these stops is, um, is that as far as we can tell, there isn't any particular public legal regime governing it. So you can end up with these sort of um, um, enormously wide discretionary powers which are say are used to detain people in often pretty difficult situations so that's the the, the challenge of the judicial review to uh, a number of individual stops but as i say with a, a whole series of sort of wider questions attached to it thanks thanks very much dan be interesting to see how that unfolds uh, i had a question for nash um you said that we're not seeing numbers at the moment of um uh, claims for settlement being refused. Um, when do you think we're going to start seeing those coming through? Um, very soon, I would expect, because the, the rules came in for it in June 2022. But obviously, it's it's people who started the route that that uh, came into place after the rules of July 2012. I'm assuming no one actually got leave for a couple of months. So people probably started around September, October 2012. That leads to September, October 2032. If it takes, I mean, it's taking a really long time uh, for the Hamas to make decisions. But it, yeah, I would expect imminently um, to start getting decisions. And sorry, I'm just going to come back to a question uh, that someone asked about children. Um, and thank you, Christine, for a side conversation. I, <laughs> actually, most children, it's parents who get charged. So actually it's unlikely that you'll see a child being refused on that basis because the invoice won't have been issued to them. So I, th I think in the, under the rules they could be refused, but in practice, I don't think they will have uh, that to the NHS. No, that's an interesting point. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, if a debt has been sold to a debt agency, is it still counted as an NHS debt? Yes, it is. It's still an NHS debt because it's still it's being communicated to the Home Office, and that um, you know if we're talking about immigration law implications, once that debt has been communicated to the Home Office, it's not it's never um, decommunicated unless it's paid off or the charges have been withdrawn. So, escalation to debt collect com debt collection companies, um, CCJs enforced against people um, remain um, an NHS debt. For the purpose of immigration law, I don't know about debt law. That's a very other complex area of law. Thanks. Thanks, Christine. Okay. Well, I think we've had a whole series of questions come through, and I know there's plenty more that we could ask. I've certainly had questions about um, Rebecca's um, ideas about um, cases that we could be exploring. Um, but I think what we'll do is we'll bring ourselves to a close. Excuse me. Not least because I'm about to lose my voice, I'm afraid. Um, so uh, we have 
we haven't had any questions coming through from the panel earlier on, so actually I think what we'll do is just, just move straight to the, the wrap up if we can. Um, so this is the first conference that um, Maternity Action and LAG have run on NHS charging, and it's been great, I think, to have such a brilliant collection of speakers and such creative ideas about challenging NHS charging. We had over 200 registrations for the conference, um, which I think is a very strong sign of growing awareness of the practice of charging for essential healthcare and the brutal impact of that on some very vulnerable people. Um, I'd like to thank Xu Xin Lu and our first and our second sets of panel speakers who've done, I think, a brilliant job in covering the complex and quite difficult area of law and policy. Um, and I'd also like to thank the people who made today happen, Christine Benson, Tessa Levin wright and Michaela Lee. And I'd also like to thank everyone who joined us today. Delighted that you could take part. Um, and we know we'll be reaching a whole range of other people through the recording of today's session as well. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.